Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. The internet is full of half-truths and all-out lies. We've all seen them, and many people on social media complaining about it. Here's your chance to show and prove. WorldAfropedia.com is a black-owned and operated encyclopedia. There are several thousand articles, but we need help. We can't uncover all the truth ourselves. So please, join us and become a writer, editor, or blogger for WorldAfropedia.com today. Every little bit counts. We owe it to the future generations to put the truth out there. Visit WorldAfropedia.com, the African-Centered Encyclopedia, a global database of African knowledge for the purpose of bringing about global African wisdom and understanding. WorldAfropedia.com Well, uh, when I came here, I, um... One of the first things that I, I thought I needed to do was to write a book. Um, I didn't want to write it in, in one real sense, I, you know, because it was painful. I didn't want to look at prison. I didn't want to deal with the trials. It was, I mean, that was hard to write, but I felt that I needed to just get that out of my system or it would just gnaw at my inside, so I did that. Another thing that was very important to me uh, when I came here to do was to bond and unite with my daughter. Uh, she was born when I was in prison, uh, and we had never had a chance to be together, to be mother and daughter. And so, um, Cuba was a place where that was a, where we were able to do that, and that was a beautiful experience, a hard experience, a painful experience. But we were able to bond. We were able to come together as a family, as mother and daughter. And I am a very proud mother and grandmother. <laughs> And I think that my family, in spite of all the things that, that, that we have suffered, uh, my mother, you know, she had a heart attack uh, right after I escaped because uh, the police just hassled her and, you know, kept banging on her door and demanding that she let uh, them search uh, her house and dating her work. Uh, my art uh, has gone through hell, uh, spent 10 days in jail and, you know, years uh, struggling uh, for my liberation. But all of our struggle has brought us more, has brought us together closer as a family and has let us appreciate the continuity of our struggle and let us appreciate the importance of families coming together and healing because I think that wherever you have people who suffer oppression you have wounded people because every day when you are African when you are Latino in the United States you get slapped slapped and slapped you, you get insulted on a daily basis. You can either ignore it, and sometimes you have to ignore it because you can't uh, fight against every time someone follows you around in the store. You can't go off every time someone uh, acts like you're stupid or retarded or, you know, uh, ignorant. Uh, you can't react to them. So what you do is you, you, it boils inside one. And so I think that uh, sometimes in our family relationships, we take things out against each other. We 
uh, we suffer silently. Children come home and when their parents ask them how was your day, they don't have the words to express that the teacher dissed them. And, you know, that day and it has been dissing them every day for the past I don't know how long. So I think that one of the things that people who are pressed have to be consciously aware of is that we have to heal. We have to heal on a personal level. We have to heal on a family level. We have to heal on a community level. And I believe that we have to heal on a spiritual level. I think that it is very important uh, for us to do that. And I think that one of the things that I have been able to do here in Cuba is to work on healing. Uh, I, you know, in the United States, you just live in a, a constant tension. You walk down the street holding your pocketbook like this. Uh, you know, you. Uh, this is the first time I've ever lived at a society in a society that is at peace. So I think that part of um, liberation for oppressed people is a, a healing process. And, and Another thing I've done here, I uh, studied, I studied here for some years, I studied social science and got a master's degree in that. Now I'm writing another, uh, finishing another book. Um, so I try to keep active and I also try to, to tell people, uh, not only Cubans, but people in the international community here, about the realities that exist in the United States, about the human rights violations. I talk about political prisoners. I talk about uh, Mumia Abu Jamal. I talk about just, you know, the reality of life in the United States instead of the fantasy that many people receive via uh, the movies, you know, because people really have a movie Disneyland vision of life in the United States. Context of white supremacy. Gus T. Renegade in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date, Friday, June 19th, 2015. So I have been told uh, this is our seventh and final study session on Asada Shakur's autobiography. I uh, hope folks have enjoyed and learned a lot uh, of the last few weeks. Uh, this book had a big impact uh, on Gus T. Renegade as well. Very influential uh, in my early stages of beginning to think seriously uh, about the problem of racism, white terrorism. Uh, we will be beginning this week on chapter 17. I know folks will certainly have in mind uh, the horror uh, down in South Carolina, uh, the incident of white terrorism at the Charleston, South Carolina church. Uh, I would encourage listeners to be mindful uh, of different elements in that tragedy that might relate to what we hear from the concluding chapters from Asada this week. Uh, I'm pretty sure there will be some uh, moments that will relate and might offer insight into what has unfolded over the past few days. But without further ado, we will get started. Context of white supremacy, Asada Shakur, her autobiography, chapter 17. Chapter 17. Over the next few years, home became a lot of places. I traveled quite a bit and met up with some really beautiful people, people so beautiful they restored my faith in humanity each time I passed through their station. Like most of us back in those days, I was new at this, learning about clandestine struggle as I lived it. I didn't have many fixed ideas at first about what I thought armed struggle within the confines of America should be like. I had done a lot of reading about it in other places, but I had no concrete idea how to apply the lessons from those struggles to the struggle of black people within the United States. It was clear that the Black Liberation Army was not a centralized, organized group with a common leadership and chain of command. Instead, there were various organizations and collectives working out of different cities, and in some of the larger cities, there were often several groups working independently of each other. Many members of the various groups had been forced into hiding as a result of the extreme police repression that took place during the late 60s and early 70s. Some had serious cases. Some had minor ones. 
and others, like me, were just wanted for questioning. Sisters and brothers joined these groups because they were committed to revolutionary struggle in general, and armed struggle in particular, and wanted to help build the armed movement in America. It was the strangest feeling. People I used to run into at rallies were now in hiding, sending messages that they wanted to hook up. Sisters and brothers from just about every revolutionary or militant group in the country were either rotting away in prison or had been forced underground. Everyone I talked to was interested in taking the struggle to a higher level, but the question was how? How to bring together all those people scattered around the country into an organized body that would be effective in struggling for black liberation? It became evident almost from the beginning that consolidation was not a good idea. There were too many security problems, and different groups had different ideologies, different levels of political consciousness, and different ideas about how armed struggle in America should be waged. On the whole, we were weak, inexperienced, disorganized, and seriously lacking in training. But the biggest problem was one of political development. There were sisters and brothers who had been so victimized by America that they were willing to fight to the death against their oppressors. They were intelligent, courageous, and dedicated, willing to make any sacrifice. But we were to find out quickly that courage and dedication was not enough. To win any struggle for liberation, You have to have the way as well as the will, an overall ideology and strategy that stem from a scientific analysis of history and present conditions. Some of the groups thought that they could just pick up arms and struggle, and that somehow people would see what they were doing and begin to struggle themselves. They wanted to engage in a do-or-die battle with the power structure in America, even though they were weak and ill-prepared for such a fight. But the most important factor is that armed struggle by itself can never bring about revolution. Revolutionary war is a people's war, and no people's war can be won without the support of the masses of people. Armed struggle can never be successful by itself. It must be part of an overall strategy for winning, and the strategy must be political as well as military. Since we do not own the TV stations or newspapers, it was easy for the news media to portray us as monsters and terrorists. The police could terrorize the black community daily, yet if one black person successfully defended himself or herself against a police attack, they were called terrorists. It soon became clear to me that our most important battle was to help politically mobilize, educate, and organize the masses of black people, and to win their minds and hearts. It was inconceivable that we could survive, much less win anything without their support. Every group fighting for freedom is bound to make mistakes, but unless you study the common fundamental laws of armed revolutionary struggle, you are bound to make unnecessary mistakes. Revolutionary war is protracted warfare. It is impossible for us to win quickly. To win, we have got to wear down our oppressors, little by little, and at the same time, strengthen our forces, slowly but surely. I understood some of my more impatient sisters and brothers. I knew that it was tempting to substitute military for political struggle, especially since all of our above-ground organizations were under vicious attack by the FBI, the CIA, and the local police agencies. All of us who saw our leaders murdered, our people shot down in cold blood, felt a need, a desire to fight back. One of the hardest lessons we had to learn is that revolutionary struggle is scientific rather than emotional. I'm not saying that we shouldn't feel anything, but decisions can't be based on love or anger. They have to be based on the objective conditions and on what is the rational, unemotional thing to do. In 1857, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that blacks were only three-fifths of a man and had no rights that whites were bound to respect. Today, more than 125 years later, we still earn less than three-fifths of what white people earn. It was plain to me that we couldn't look to the courts for freedom and justice any more than we could expect to gain our liberation by participating in the U.S. political system, and it was pure fantasy to think we could gain them by begging. The only alternative left was to fight for them— and we are going to have to fight like any other people who have fought for liberation. I wasn't one who believed that we should wait until our political struggle had reached a high point before we began to organize the underground. I felt that it was important to start building underground structures as soon as possible, and although I felt the major task of the underground should be organizing and building, I didn't feel that armed acts of resistance should be ruled out. As long as they didn't impede our long-range plans, guerrilla units should be able to carry out a few well-planned, well-timed, armed actions that were well-coordinated with above-ground political objectives. Not any old kind of actions, but actions that black people would clearly understand and support, and actions that were well-publicized in the black community. Chapter 18 
After my acquittal in the Queens Bank robbery case in Brooklyn Federal Court on January 16, 1976, I was brought back to New Jersey, placed in the basement of the Middlesex County Jail for men in solitary confinement, and held there for more than a year until the Jersey trial was over. Lennox Hines, then the head of the National Conference of Black Lawyers, together with the other members of the defense team, filed a civil suit against the state, charging that my conditions were cruel and inhuman. After a long, drawn-out court battle, both sides agreed that a hearing officer should review my jail conditions and make a ruling. The hearing officer was a man named Plushnik, who was appointed by the state. We had no say whatsoever in who was appointed, and, therefore, expected the decision to be favorable to the state. But he surprised everybody and ruled that my conditions of imprisonment were indeed inhuman and recommended that they be changed at once. But, through a series of appeals and legal maneuvers, the state succeeded in keeping me confined in that basement. When the government finds it convenient to follow its own laws and administrative procedures, it does. And when it finds that these same laws are inconvenient for their own purposes, it simply ignores them. I decided that I wanted Stanley Cohen and Evelyn to work together on the case. This turned out to be a mistake, since they were not exactly in love with each other. Neither Stanley nor Evelyn was a New Jersey lawyer, and we had to get a New Jersey lawyer to be on the case. Ray Brown was busy with other commitments and couldn't possibly do it. Stanley asked a young, white, New Jersey lawyer named Stuart Ball, and after some reservations, he agreed to be the admitting lawyer. Stanley also wanted a young lawyer, Lawrence Stern, to act as his assistant. Even though Evelyn was involved in the defense and Lennox was handling the civil suit around my prison conditions, the Conference of Black Lawyers assigned a young black lawyer from Mississippi named Louis Myers to work on the case. I was delighted. Everyone knew that the New Jersey trial was the big one and that my chances of receiving a fair trial were about slim to none. So the strategy was to try to surround the defense team with as much resources and expertise as possible. It sounded like a good idea, but if there was ever a case of too many cooks in the kitchen, this case was it. Almost from the beginning, the defense team was beset by personality conflicts. The problems were magnified greatly by the fact that nobody was being paid. The lawyers were having problems covering even their bare expenses. It seemed like every other month, one or another of the lawyers was asking the judge to be relieved from the case. We were in dire need of experts. We needed to find a ballistics expert and a forensic chemist, among others, to refute the state's charges. We were also in desperate need of an investigator to locate some of the doctors who had treated me while I was hospitalized and other potential witnesses. We fought and harped on this point until finally the judge, Theodore Appleby, issued an order that the state pay for the experts. But once we got the order, we found that we were in the same position that we started from. Without exception, everybody that we went to for help turned us down. The types of experts we needed were almost always police or are working for police agencies. Because my case involved the murder of a police officer, none of them would touch the case. The most crucial part of the prosecutor's case was the scientific testimony, alleging that I had huge amounts of dead state troopers' blood on me. We wanted someone who knew what they were doing to go over every inch of those clothes, to check out what was on them, and also to check out what has been done to them. But we could not find one forensic chemist to work for us, let alone testify for us. If they had, they would never again have been able to work in peace for any police agency. People never hear about this side of a trial, but there is no place a defendant in a criminal trial can go to find experts in sciences commonly known as police sciences. The police can virtually write up a report saying anything they want, and there's no way of refuting it. And there have been cases where experts have been double agents, working for a defendant while secretly working with the prosecutor. One of the amazing things was the number of student supporters who gave their time and energy to help us. They volunteered to index and organize past transcripts and, together with the political activists, did a survey of prospective jurors in Middlesex County. Members of the defense committee published a bulletin to keep people informed about what was happening in the case and also did speaking engagements and fundraising. People circulated petitions and demonstrated in front of the courthouse. They volunteered to do typing, handle the phones, etc. Entertainers like Harry Belafonte, Ossie Davis, and Ruby Dee performed at fundraising benefits. Poets like June Jordan, Audre Lorde, and Sonia Sanchez, among others, gave poetry readings. Political activists like Angela Davis and Amiri Baraka worked hard to educate the people about what was happening in New Jersey. When Angela Davis came to New Jersey to do a speaking engagement on my behalf, the New Jersey prosecutor's office ambushed her and her party, harassing them until the moment they left the state. She tried to visit me at the jail, and not only did the judge forbid her to visit me, but he stopped all of my other visits as well. 
One of the most moving statements I have ever heard was a speech Judge Bruce Wright made at a fundraising rally for me. Judge Bruce Wright is a black judge who was removed from the criminal court bench in New York because he was too fair and honest, and he did something that was unforgivable. He set poor people's bail at amounts they could afford to pay. The courts will never be anything but a tool of repression until there are judges like Bruce Wright presiding over black people's trials. There were many, many people who I never got to meet, even though they worked so hard on my behalf. And even though I never got a chance to thank all the black people, white people, third world people, all the students, feminists, revolutionaries, activists, etc. who worked on the case, I thank you now. A lot of the pretrial conferences had to do with nothing more than the defense making motions and the judge denying them. Every time we went to court, the judge made a point of reading into the record that I had refused to stand up for him. He was one of those racist white dogs who really believed he was Massa. He really took that your honor stuff seriously. If he could have made people bow to him and kiss his hand, he would have done it. He claimed that he was a stickler for the decorum of his courtroom. Plenty of decorum, but not a bit of justice. Stand for him, it was out of the question. He was a real dyed-in-the-wool cracker. The kind they would send to wipe out the natives in Africa, make Central America safe for United Fruit Company, or run a sterilization center in Puerto Rico. Stanley Cohen came to see me. He was excited and upbeat. His good news was that he had found an investigator, an old friend of his who owed him a favor. His friend had contacts with the New Jersey State Police and thought they might be able to come up with some information on Harper, the police officer who was the main witness. He was also making progress in finding a forensic chemist. We both felt that at least some of the scientific reports had been fudged by the New Jersey State Troopers. We talked about this and a million things before the visit ended. He was so positive. He said he had a plan, something he wanted to check out, but he didn't want to discuss it and raise my hopes prematurely. That was the last time I saw Stanley Cohen. A few days later, I received a phone call. Stanley Cohen was dead. His body had been found in his home with evidence of trauma. Nobody, with the exception of the police and Stanley's family, knows to this day the cause of death. The newspaper stated Stanley died of natural causes, but a friend of Stanley's, a doctor, told me he had talked to the coroner's office and had been given conflicting stories. No one knows for sure how Stanley died, and we probably never will. The one thing we do know is that after his death, all the legal papers on my case came up missing. Evelyn talked to Phyllis, Stanley's widow, and she gave her every legal paper she could find that had something to do with my case, but the bulk of the material was still missing. Finally, Evelyn found out that the New York City police had my legal papers. How did they get them? I asked her. I don't even want to think about it, she answered. I could hardly believe all this was happening. It felt so strange. The New York police claimed they had taken my papers from Stanley's house as evidence. Evidence of what? I asked Evelyn. Apparently, my legal papers were the only property the New York Police Department had removed from his house. It took more than a month to get some of them back. Some were never recovered. None of the notes about the investigator or the forensic chemist were found. All the notes on the trial strategy we had mapped out were missing. It was weird. I thought of Stanley's family and what they must have been going through. The circumstances of his death were so strange. I walked around with an empty feeling in my stomach for a long time. After Stanley's death, William Kunstler joined the defense team. The first thing the judge did after admitting Kunstler to the case was to rescind the order for state-paid experts, claiming the lawyers had failed to move fast enough to get them. I became more suspicious than before. I couldn't understand why Appleby, all of a sudden, was so anxious we not have expert witnesses. It was obvious that without some financial help, I would never be able to afford expert witnesses. I didn't have a thin dime to my name. Appleby's strategy was to completely intimidate the lawyers, to harass them, threaten them until they became fearful of mounting any significant opposition to the legal lynching that was supposed to be my trial. Since there were no funds to pay for anything, the defense committees and the lawyers were forced to launch a fundraising campaign. The first time Bill Kunstler spoke in New Jersey... Appleby attempted to have him thrown off the case, charging him with improper conduct and conduct that was prejudicial to the administration of justice. The improper conduct was giving a lecture at Rutgers University, during which he said that we needed money for expert witnesses, that the conditions of my confinement were detrimental to my aiding in my defense, and that under the law, I was presumed innocent until proven guilty. 
Applebee's order to show cause why Bill should not be thrown off the case accomplished what it intended. Instead of preparing for trial, the lawyers were forced to spend time and energy preparing for the two-day hearing that would determine whether or not Bill stayed on the case. Applebee finally decided Bill would remain, but only after we'd spent a month dealing with that madness. The implication of the hearing was clear. Any attempt the lawyers made to defend me would be met with the judge's hostility. Applebee threatened every single one of the lawyers with contempt, not once or twice, but regularly. Lou Myers attended a fundraising cocktail party at which Angela Davis spoke. Someone sent a letter to the U.S. Treasury in Washington, and approximately 10 days later, he was under investigation by the Internal Revenue Service. Evelyn was repeatedly harassed by Appleby. Not one day went by when the so-called impartial judge failed to show his hostility to the defense team. The lawyers uncovered evidence that the offices across from the courthouse that they and the defense team were using were bugged. Motions for an investigation were denied. During a press conference, Lennox Hines had the courage to call the trial exactly what it was, a legal lynching and a kangaroo court. Appleby cited him for contempt, and an effort was made to disbar him. Only after he took his appeal to the highest court in New Jersey was he permitted to continue practicing as a lawyer in the state of New Jersey. The trial began on January 17, 1977, the same day Gary Gilmore was shot in Utah. Gary Gilmore was the first person legally executed since the death penalty was struck down by the U.S. Supreme Court in the early 1970s. His execution set the climate for the trial. The judge denied almost every one of our motions, including my right to defend myself and act as co-counsel, a change of venue, a motion to review Harper's police record, a motion to introduce evidence that I had been victimized by the government's counterintelligence program, COINTELPRO, etc., Even though the National Jury Project had done a study of Middlesex County and had found that 83% of the people had heard about my case in the media and 70% had already formed an opinion about my guilt, the court maintained that I could receive a fair trial. The judge said he would question the jurors and make sure that they were fair and impartial. Appleby took great pains to avoid asking potential jurors whether they thought I was guilty, electing to ask them instead whether they could put their opinions aside. He carefully avoided asking their opinions about me, the Black Liberation Army, the Black Panther Party, Black militants, or anything else that had been negatively and biasedly reported in newspapers. The trial lawyers had no right to question jurors. Appleby's voir dire was designed to make sure the most hypocritical, opinionated jurors stayed on the jury. Here are two examples taken directly from the transcript. Question. Have you heard about this case? Answer. Yes, I have. Question. From what source may you have heard about the case? Answer. Newspapers. Question. And have you discussed it with other people? Answer. Occasionally. Question. And based upon whatever you may have heard from any source whatsoever, do you feel that you have already in your own mind formed an opinion as to the guilt or innocence of this defendant? Answer. Well, to be perfectly honest, I think I would be a little biased. Question. Let me ask you another question. In the event that you were chosen to serve, do you feel that you could sit and listen to all the evidence in the case and then judge it fairly and impartially and apply the law that the judge gives to you and put aside completely any previous opinions or conceptions or ideas about anything in the case? And then do you believe that you could render a fair verdict as to the guilt or innocence of the defendant? Answer. I think I could. Question. Do you believe that you could? Answer. I think so. Example number two. Question. Do you feel that based upon whatever information you may have accumulated about the case from any source whatsoever, that you have already formed an opinion in your mind as to the guilt or innocence of this defendant? Answer. I would think, yeah, I would, I would think that she was guilty, yeah. Question. You feel that she's guilty? Answer. Yes. Question. And let me ask you another question. In the event that you might be selected to serve as a juror in this case, do you feel that you could sit and listen to the evidence and judge it impartially, apply the law the judge gives you, set aside this opinion that you have already formed? Answer. Yes, I probably could. Question. And then still judge impartially whether she's guilty or innocent? Answer. Yeah, depending on the evidence and all that. These were typical of the answers given. 
the judge refused to remove the above two jurors for cause on the basis of bias that would prevent them from being fair and impartial jurors, and our preemptory challenges were quickly exhausted. Remaining on the final jury were two friends, one girlfriend, and two nephews of New Jersey State Troopers. The so-called jury selection process was the biggest farce in legal history. About halfway through the so-called jury selection process, I was ready to call it a day. As bad as this jury sounded, it looked even worse. I didn't want to participate, but almost everyone on the defense team thought not participating was a mistake. If you don't, we'll never get anything on the record. You'll never even be able to convince an appeal court of anything. You've got to get up there and tell your side of the story. We can prove by the medical testimony that you were shot in the back with your hands raised in the air. We can prove that Harper shot first. We can prove that after you were shot, your hand was paralyzed, and from the location of his gunshot wound, it would have been impossible for you to have shot him with your left hand. We can prove Harper shot first. We can prove this if you take the stand. We can prove... dot dot dot... I was tired of this case. I damn sure didn't believe that any appeals court was going to free me or that any racist, white, prejudiced jury was either. It was obvious I didn't have one chance in a million of receiving any kind of justice. The financial problems, expert witness problems, personality problems among the lawyers, in addition to rotting away in solitary confinement, had taken their toll on me. Every day when I entered the courtroom, I felt like I was entering the theater of the absurd. I wanted no part of it. The lawyer said that I could create a political climate which, they thought, would force the appeal court to give in if I participated in the trial, and put on the record the fact that I was innocent. They were convinced that at the last minute the forensic chemist they were trying to locate in Canada was going to come in and save the day. I didn't put any stock in that, but I knew that keeping the momentum going around what was happening was important. I decided to remain and participate, even though it was killing me. The trial went absurdly on. An all-white jury was selected, based on the advice of Kunstler and the jury project, who decided that even though the jurors seated in the panels were horrible, the others were worse. Not only did the judge deny my motion to act as co-counsel, he refused to permit the lawyers to read my opening statement to the jury. The defense team's headquarters, located in New Brunswick, was broken into, papers rummaged through and stolen, and the judge refused to investigate, calling the motion frivolous. The state's witnesses, almost all of whom were pigs, got up and said whatever they were told to say. We had no expert witnesses to refute or even evaluate their testimony. The main witness, Harper, the state trooper I was supposed to have shot, testified that he told an untruth on direct examination, but denied it was a lie. I spent most of the trial looking up at the ceiling and hating myself for sitting there in the first place. When the time came for me to testify, I was shocked. I had thought I would be able to go into everything, being a fugitive, how I became a fugitive, the entire political scenario that led to being in the courtroom, but then they told me something about opening the door. Opening the door, it was explained, was like opening Pandora's box. If I gave the political reasons for my being a fugitive, the prosecutor could then introduce all kinds of prejudicial evidence that had nothing to do with what had happened on the turnpike in order to show my criminal intent. If I opened the door... The prosecutor would be able to introduce manuals of guerrilla warfare and a whole stack of other material they found in the car that had nothing to do with this trial. In the absence of political witnesses, whose subpoenas for their appearance the judge had refused to issue, who would have testified about COINTELPRO's systematic attack on the black liberation movement and on blacks in general, my testimony would have been distorted. I wanted to back out completely, denounce the trial, but it was too late. The only way out was to testify— get my side of what happened on the record, and avoid opening the door. The year of solitary confinement had made me almost mute. As I testified, I held on to a small picture of my child. When I sit back today and examine why I participated in that trial, I think I must have been crazy. I guess I had been through too many trials and had gotten too many acquittals and let that stuff go to my head. Three other indictments had been dismissed. One in Queen's State Supreme Court, charging me with killing policemen, was dismissed because the judge, after examining the grand jury minutes, determined that there was not even enough evidence for me to have been indicted. The other two, one in Brooklyn Supreme Court and the other in Supreme Court in New York County, were dismissed for failure of the state to bring me to trial for six years after the indictments had been returned. Participating in the New Jersey trial was unprincipled and incorrect. By participating, I participated in my own oppression. I should have known better and not lent dignity or credence to that sham. In the long run, the people are our only appeal. 
The only ones who can free us are ourselves. Chapter 19 I was transferred on April 8, 1978, to the Maximum Security Prison for Women in Alderson, West Virginia, the federal facility designed to hold the most dangerous women in the country. I had been convicted of no federal crime, but under the Interstate Compact Agreement, any prisoner can be shipped, like cargo, to any jail in U.S. territory, including the Virgin Islands, miles away from family, friends, and lawyers. Through the device of this agreement, Sundiata had been transferred to Marion Prison in Illinois, the federal prison that was the most brutal concentration camp in the country. Alderson was in the middle of the West Virginia mountains, and it seemed as if the mountains formed an impenetrable barrier between the prison and the rest of the world. It had no airport, and to reach it, days of travel were necessary. The trip to Alderson was so expensive and difficult that most of the women received family visits only once or twice a year. I was housed in the Maximum Security Unit, or MSU, called Davis Hall. It was surrounded by an electronic fence topped by barbed wire, which in turn was covered by concertina wire, a razor-sharp type of wire that had been outlawed by the Geneva Convention. It was a prison within a prison. This place had a stillness to it, like some kind of bizarre death row. Everything was sterile and dead. There were three major groups in MSU, the Nazis, the nigger lovers, and me. I was the only black woman in the unit, with the exception of one other woman who left almost immediately after I arrived. The Nazis had been sent to Alderson from a prison in California, where they had been accused of setting inmates on fire. They were members of the Aryan Sisterhood, a female wing of the Aryan Brotherhood, a white racist group that operates in California prisons and is well known for its attacks on black prisoners. Hooked up with the Nazis were the Manson family women, Sandra Good and Linda Squeaky Fromm. Sandra had been sentenced to 15 years for threatening the lives of business executives and government officials, and Fromm was serving a life sentence for attempting to kill President Gerald Ford. They were like the Bobsy twins and clear out of their minds. They called themselves Red and Blue. Every day, Red wore red from head to toe, and Blue wore blue. They were so fanatic in their devotion to Charles Manson that they wrote to him every day, informing him about everything that was happening at MSU, They waited for his orders, and you can be sure that if he told them to kill someone, they would die trying to do it. Also hooked up with the Nazis were the hillbilly prisoners, an obese sow who never bathed and walked around barefoot, and a tobacco-chewing butch who acted like she was in the Confederate Army. There was one independent Nazi who had fallen out with the others. She sported a huge swastika embroidered on her jeans. Luckily, Rita Brown, a white revolutionary from the George Jackson Brigade, a group based on the West Coast, was among the four or five nigger lovers. She was a feminist and a lesbian and helped me to better understand many issues in the women's liberation movement. Unlike Jane Alpert, whom I met in the federal prison in New York and whom I couldn't stand either personally or politically, Rita did not separate the oppression of women from the racism and classism of U.S. society. We agree that sexism, like racism, was generated by capitalist imperialist governments and that women would never be liberated as long as institutions that controlled our lives existed. I respected Rita because she really practiced sisterhood and wasn't just one of those big mouths who go on and on about men. I'm sure that a lot of prison officials thought I'd never leave the place alive. It was the perfect setup for a setup, and I dealt with the situation seriously. I didn't look for trouble, but I let the Nazis know that I was ready to defend myself at any time, and that if they wanted ass, like they say in prison, they would have to bring ass. I made it clear to them that I hated them as much as they hated me, and that if anybody's mother had to cry, it would be theirs, not Mrs. Johnson. After a few run-ins, the Nazis stayed out of my way. After I had been at Alderson for a while, we learned that the MSU would be closed down because it had been declared unconstitutional. A phase-out stratification program was implemented that enabled those in MSU to leave it during the day and to participate in the same activities permitted to those in general population. I got a job working on the general mechanics crew, was allowed recreation, attended classes, and was able to eat and visit with the other women in general population. Many of the sisters were black and poor, and from D.C., where every crime is a violation of a federal statute. They were beautiful sisters, serving outrageous sentences for minor offenses. Similar to the situation that existed at the federal prison in New York, some women could not afford to buy cigarettes without foregoing necessities, while others had money, contacts, wore fur coats, and lived as if they were in a different prison. That small group of women had been convicted of drug trafficking. Rumor had it that they performed the same services in prison as they had on the street, 
only now they worked for the guards. One day, as I was returning to Davis Hall, a middle-aged woman with salt-and-pepper hair caught my eye. She had a dignified schoolteacher look. Something drew me towards her. As I searched her face, I could see that she was also searching mine. Our eyes locked in a questioning gaze. Lolita? I ventured. Asada, she responded. And there, in the middle of those Alderson prison grounds, we hugged and kissed each other. For me, this was one of the greatest honors of my life. Lolita Lebron was one of the most respected political prisoners in the world. Ever since I had first learned about her courageous struggle for the independence of Puerto Rico, I had read everything I could find that had been written about her. She had spent a quarter of a century behind bars and had refused parole unless her comrades were also freed. After all those years, she had remained strong, unbent and unbroken, still dedicated to the independence of Puerto Rico and the liberation of her people. She deserved more respect than anyone could possibly give her, and I could not do enough to demonstrate my respect. In our subsequent meetings, I must have been quite a pain in her neck, falling all over myself to carry her tray, to get a chair for her, or to do whatever I could for her. Lolita had been through hell in prison, yet she was amazingly calm and extremely kind. She had suffered years of isolation in Davis Hall, in addition to years of political and personal isolation. Until the upsurge of the movement for Puerto Rican independence in the late 60s, she had received very little support. Years had gone by without a visit. For years, she had been cut off from her country, her culture, her family, and had not been able to speak her own language. Her only daughter had died while she was in prison. I supported Lolita a hundred percent, but there was one thing about which we did not agree. At the time we met, Lolita was somewhat anti-communist and anti-socialist. She was extremely religious and, I think, believed that religion and socialism were two opposing forces, that socialists and communists were completely opposed to religion and religious freedom. After the resurgence of the Puerto Rican independence movement, Lolita was visited by all kinds of people. Some were pseudo-revolutionary robots who attacked her for her religious beliefs, telling her that to be a revolutionary, she had to give up her belief in God. It apparently had never occurred to those fools that Lolita was more revolutionary than they could ever be, and that her religion had helped her to remain strong and committed all those years. I was infuriated by their crass, misguided arrogance. I had become close friends with a Catholic nun, Mary Alice, while at Alderson, who introduced me to liberation theology. I had read some articles by Camilo Torres, the revolutionary priest, and I knew that there were a lot of revolutionary priests and nuns in Latin America, but I didn't know too much about liberation theology. I did know that Jesus had driven the money changers out of the temples and said that the meek would inherit the earth and a lot of other things that were directly opposed to capitalism. He had told the rich to give away their wealth and said that it is easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Matthew 19. 24. Matthew 19, 24. I knew a little bit, but I had too much respect for Lolita to open my mouth carelessly. I decided to study liberation theology so that I could have an intelligent conversation with her. I never got around to it, though. The maximum security unit closed, and I was shipped back to New Jersey. Lolita is free now, and she is no longer isolated from what is going on in her part of the world or in her church. I know that wherever she is, she is praying and struggling for her people. Chapter 20 My mother brings my daughter to see me at the Clinton Correctional Facility for Women in New Jersey, where I had been sent from Alderson. I am delirious. She looks so tall. I run up to kiss her. She barely responds. She is distant and standoffish. Pangs of guilt and sorrow fill my chest. I can see that my child is suffering. It is stupid to ask what is wrong. She is four years old, and except for those pitiful little visits, although my mother has brought her to see me every week, wherever I am, with the exception of the time I was in Alderson, she has never been with her mother. I can feel something welling up in my baby. I look at my mother, my face a question mark. My mother is suffering too. I try to play. I make my arms into an elephant's trunk, stalking around the visiting room jungle. It does not work. My daughter refuses to play baby elephant, or tiger, or anything. She looks at me like I am the buffoon I must look like. I try the choo-choo train routine, and the la-la-la song, but she is not amused. I try talking to her, but she is puffed up and sullen. I go over and try to hug her. 
In a hot second, she is all over me. All I can feel are these little four-year-old fists banging away at me. Every bit of her force is in those punches. They really hurt. I let her hit me until she is tired. It's all right, I tell her. Let it out. She is standing in front of me, her face contorted with anger, looking spent. She backs away and leans against the wall. It's okay, I tell her. Mommy understands. You're not my mother, she screams, the tears rolling down her face. You're not my mother and I hate you. I feel like crying too. I know she is confused about who I am. She calls me Mommy Asada and she calls my mother Mommy. I try to pick her up. She knocks my hand away. You can get out of here if you want to, she screams. You just don't want to. No, I can't, I say weakly. Yes, you can, she accuses. You just don't want to. I look helplessly at my mother. Her face is choked with pain. Tell her to try to open the bars, she says in a whisper. I can't open the door, I tell my daughter. I can't get through the bars. You try and open the bars. My daughter goes over to the bar door that leads to the visiting room. She pulls and she pushes. She yanks and she hits and she kicks the bars until she falls onto the floor, a heap of exhaustion. I go over and pick her up. I hold and rock and kiss her. There is a look of resignation on her face that I can't stand. We spend the rest of the visit talking and playing quietly on the floor. When the guard says the visit is over, I cling to her for dear life. She holds her head high and her head back straight as she walks out of the prison. She waves goodbye to me, her face clouded and worried, looking like a little adult. I go back to my cage and cry until I vomit. I decide that it is time to leave. To my daughter, Kakuya. I have shabby dreams for you of some vague freedom I have never known. Baby, I don't want you hungry or thirsty or out in the cold, and I don't want the frost to kill your fruit before it ripens. I can see a sunny place, life exploding green. I can see your bright bronze skin at ease with all the flowers and the centipedes. I can hear laughter, not grown from ridicule, and words not prompted by ego or greed or jealousy. I see a world where hatred has been replaced by love, and me replaced by we. And I can see a world where you, building and exploring, strong and fulfilled, will understand and go beyond my shabby little dreams. Chapter 21 My grandmother came all the way from North Carolina. She came to tell me about her dream. My grandmother had been dreaming all her life, and the dreams have come true. My grandmother dreams of people passing and babies being born and people being free, but it is never specific. Red birds sitting on fences, rainbows at sunset, conversations with people long gone. My grandmother's dreams have always come when they need My grandmother's dreams have always come when they were needed and have always meant what we needed them to mean. She dreamed my mother would be a school teacher, my aunt would go to law school, and during the hard times, she dreamed the good times were coming. She told us what we needed to be told and made us believe it like nobody else could have. She did her part. The rest was up to us. We had to make it real. Dreams and reality are opposites. Action synthesizes them. I was extremely pleased that she had come. Her air was confident and victorious. The rest of the family prompted her to tell me her dream. You're coming home soon, my grandmother told me, catching my eyes and staring down into them. I don't know when it will be, but you're coming home. You're getting out of here. It won't be too long, though. It will be much less time than you've already been here. Excited, I asked her to tell me about her dream. We were all talking, I noticed, in a conspiratorial tone. I dreamed you were in our old house in Jamaica. I don't know if you remember that house or not. I assured her that I did. I dreamed that I was dressing you, she said, putting your clothes on. Dressing me, I repeated. Yes, dressing you. Fear ran up and down my back. Was I little or grown? You were grown up in my dream. I felt slightly sick. Maybe my grandmother dreamt about my death. Maybe she dreamt that I was killed while trying to escape. Why else would she be dressing me if I wasn't dead? My grandmother caught my drift of thought. 
no, you're all right, you're alive. It's just as plain as the nose on your face. You're coming home. I know what I'm talking about. Don't ask me to explain it anymore because I can't. I just know you're going to come home and that you're going to be all right. I drilled her for more details. Some she gave and some she didn't. Finally, after I asked a thousand questions, my grandmother let all the authority show in her voice. I know it will happen because I dreamt it. You're getting out of this place and I know it. That's all there is to it. My grandmother sat looking at me. There was a kind of smile on her face I can't describe. I knew she was serious. My grandmother's dreams were notorious. Her dreams came true. All her life, uncanny senses have been like radar, picking up and identifying all kinds of things that we don't even see. My family and I just sat there, vibing on each other, talking and laughing, bringing up old memories and telling funny stories. Calmness rolled down my body like thick honey. When I got back to my cell, I thought about it all. No amount of scientific, rational thinking could diminish the high that I felt. A tangly, giddy excitement had caught hold of me. I had gotten drunk on my family's arrogant, carefree optimism. I literally danced in my cell, singing, Feet, don't fail me now! I sang the feet part real low, so I guess the guards must have thought I was bugging out, stomping around my cage, singing, Feet, feet! You can't win a race just by running, my mother told me when I was little. You have to talk to yourself. Huh? I had asked. You have to talk to yourself when you are running and telling yourself you can win. It had become a habit of sorts. Anytime I am faced with something difficult or almost impossible, I chant. Over the years, I have developed different kinds of chants, but I always fall back on the old one. I can, I can, yes, I can. I called my grandparents a day or two before I escaped. I wanted to hear their voices one last time before I went. I was feeling kind of mush, and so as not to sound suspicious, I told them I wanted to hear some more about the family's history, tracing the ties back to slavery. All too soon, it was time to hang up. Your grandmother wants to say something else to you, my grandfather told me. I love you, my grandmother said. We don't want you to get used to that place, do you hear? Don't let yourself get used to it. No, grandmommy, I won't. Every day out in the street now, I remind myself that black people in America are oppressed. It's necessary that I do that. People get used to anything. The less you think about your oppression, the more your tolerance for it grows. After a while, people just think oppression is the normal state of things. But to become free, you have to become acutely aware of being a slave. The Tradition Carry it on now, carry it on. Carry it on now, carry it on. Carry on the tradition. There were black people since the childhood of mine who carried it on. In Ghana and Mali and Timbuktu, we carried it on. Carried on the tradition. We hid in the bush when the slave masters came, holding spears. And when the moment was ripe, leaped out and lanced the lifeblood of would-be masters. We carried it on. On our slave ships, hurling ourselves into oceans, slitting the throats of our captors, we took their whips and their ships. Blood flowed into the Atlantic, and it wasn't all ours. We carried it on. Fed missy arsenic apple pies, stole the axes from the shed, went and chopped off the master's head. We ran, we fought, we organized a railroad, an underground. We carried it on. In newspapers, in meetings, in arguments, and street fights, we carried it on. In tales told to children, in chants and cantatas, in poems and blues songs and saxophone screams, we carried it on. In classrooms, in churches, in courtrooms, in prisons, we carried it on. On soapboxes and picket lines, welfare lines, unemployment lines, our lives on the line, we carried it on. In sit-ins and pray-ins and march-ins and die-ins, we carried it on. On cold Missouri midnights, pitting shotguns against lynch mobs, on burning Brooklyn streets, pitting rocks against rifles, we carried it on. Against water hoses and bulldogs, against nightsticks and bullets, against tanks and tear gas, needles and nooses, bombs and birth control, we carried it on. In Selma and San Juan, Mozambique, Mississippi, in Brazil, and in Boston, we carried it on. Through the lies and the sellouts, the mistakes and the madness, through pain and hunger and frustration, 
we carried it on, carried on the tradition, carried a strong tradition, carried a proud tradition, carried a black tradition, carry it on, pass it down to the children, pass it down, carry it on, carry it on now, carry it on to freedom. Context of white supremacy. We have one more segment to go. The postscript for the text. Uh, it's a little chunky, so significant bit of reading still to come. But uh, context of white supremacy, if folks would like to participate, share thoughts on what we heard from the first segment, feel free to chime in. The number to dial seven six zero five six nine seven six seven six the code is five six four nine four three pound press star six if you would like to participate that number one more time is seven six zero five six nine seven six seven six the code is five six four nine four three pound press star six if you would like to participate you can use the free flash phone uh, works anywhere in the world uh, should be linked at the black talk radio network if you can't find it the address you can use to access it is tiny t-i-n-y dot c-c forward slash one race and that is the number one that address one more time tiny t-i-n-y dot c-c forward slash one race and that is the number one when you put in that address click the link on the left side of the page it will say free flash phone click it it will open a tiny window on your screen the top line it is a drop down menu select the number that I just gave out which again is seven six zero five six nine seven six seven six the next line it will ask for the code that code again is five six four nine four three final line it will ask for a name you can click random keys put in your real name nickname whatever you're comfortable with once you get all that entered Click the green button. You'll see it in your window. Uh, it will connect you to the program. You should be able to hear us live. Uh, if you would like to participate, it is the same procedure. You will see the dial pad on your screen. Press star six. Uh, once you do that, you will hear the audio prompt. Press number one. I will see your hand on the switchboard and we will get you on the air. Uh, with that said, I know uh, folks certainly uh, have been preoccupied uh, with the tragedy in South, uh, South Carolina. Uh, I thought it would be interesting um, concluding uh, this text this week to see, uh, to just look for overlaps between things that Asada Shakur might have to say and, and what's uh, taking place in South Carolina. Not looking for uh, tangents and, and <laughs> ways for people to go. Uh, off of the book, but just uh, kind of keeping an eye out for, for things that relate uh, to help us see the continuum uh, of what has been happening, the war of white terrorism against black people. That's it. We'll go ahead and get everybody on the line. I guess I'll mention really quick as well the audio clip that we started off uh, the segment this week with. Uh, there's a YouTube video. There was a conference in 1997. Uh, held in Cuba, looked like some younger people 
uh, from the States, uh, went down and, you know, had a talk with her, were able to ask Asada some questions and what have you. It's pretty interesting, but that was what you heard at the beginning where she was, uh, giving her response, uh, about writing the book and, and the time with her daughter and the significance of, of healing, which I thought was really important, but it might be worth it to check out that whole, uh, dialogue because it was, uh, it was pretty revealing. And she talked about some of the segments from the book. That's it. Uh, the folks who dialed in who have a hand up, uh, you should be with us. Uh, feel free to chime in if you have thoughts you would like to share on the book. Yes, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Uh, greetings, Gus. Greetings to the callers and listeners. It's been before here. I want to start my commentary uh going back a little bit chapter 16 um uh, after she had discovered that she was wanted by the fbi she decided she needed a disguise so she chose to look like a poor black woman you know it seems uh interesting that that's exactly what she was at the time she made uh an interesting statement uh while looking up under a wig you know she said a whole generation of black women hiding out under dead white people's hair and she made another the, the interesting statement that i wanted to make was that she said maybe we are all running and hiding maybe we're all running from something all living a clandestine existence. I felt that uh, it was pretty profound. Um, another thing in that section, and I'll be through with that, is when she lived in that rent control apartment, you know, she had noticed two white men outside her apartment sitting in a car reading a newspaper. Obviously, uh, uh, she was under surveillance and the apartment was bugged the phone was bugged she had seen strangers asking her neighbors questions and with all this activity going on she still donated the apartment to the black panther party after she had left the party you know, about the same time she was leaving the party, you know, uh, that didn't seem, you know, uh, that didn't seem right to me, you know. But uh, moving on, uh, on page uh, 244, she said that when the government finds it convenient to follow its own laws and administrative procedures, it does. But when it finds that these same laws are inconvenient for their purposes, it simply ignores them. And I can add to that that they change procedures and laws as they go so that it'll fit whatever their ultimate purpose is, especially dealing with black or non black uh, individuals in the justice system. Um, she mentioned a lot about different judges. You know, I, it's amazing that she could even remember all these judges' names. But uh, uh, Poskinsky, oh, I may be screwing it up, but he ruled that the conditions in the prison where she was was inhuman and that it should be changed, but uh, no changes came. And uh, one other judge, and Gus, you may have to get the cow there already, because she mentioned Judge Bruce Wright. Judge Bruce Wright was a black judge known for lowering bail so that black people could afford uh, post their bond 
whether he married a white woman, Elizabeth Davidson, and true to form, uh, she announced his death. He died in his sleep in 2005. She told his family about his death after she had him cremated. That's, that's right. This white woman had Judge Wright cremated without allowing the family to see him for closure. And I think uh, an act of racism at its lowest point. How dare I? Racist woman, standard operating procedure. She mentioned another judge, uh, Judge Appleby. Description of him was died in the wool crack. I think in the book there was a misprint. They still died, D-Y-E-D, but I, I think that that phrase originated when wool is dyed, it was spun into fabric, so it's less likely to fade or change. So her description of Judge Appleby was a person with strong opinions or beliefs that was unlikely to change the view. Sounds like a practitioner of the religion of white supremacy. A strong belief backed up by action. And he stayed true to his action by harassing every lawyer that came before him in her defense. Uh, one of the lawyers I'd like to speak briefly about was uh, Stanley Cohen. Uh, she was excited, you know, talking to him. He had some information. Uh, but later she found out that he was found dead in his apartment. And I think that uh, his so-called friend in the New York State Troopers, uh, flipped and sold him out because the papers and the strategies for the trial ended up in police custody. And another thing, it's interesting that uh, there's, there was a lawyer, it's another modern day lawyer, Stanley Cohen, by the same name, defense lawyer, you know, was sent to prison for tax evasion known for defending people that the government wanted to uh, extricate. But these uh, racist white females setting inmates on fire, Nazis, and Aryan sisterhood, you know, it's, it's, you know, for people that have the impression that the white female is not culpable in this whole racist scheme and the system of white supremacy is just absurd. But I have to admit that I had been hoodwinked to a certain degree. I mean, I wasn't completely sold, you know, that they uh, were not culpable. But page uh, 262, you know, she said that the less you think about your oppression, the more your tolerance for it grows. After a while, people just think oppression is a normal state of things. And that's all I'll mention about the uh Mass murder and act of terrorism in South Carolina is that when you got a state where you the Confederate flag is flying outside of the courthouse and all the major federal state buildings, and the state flag itself, I believe, looks like is similar to the Confederate flag, it's not exactly. And then all of the atrocities that's happened in that state and people 
will be photographed, setting their hole in hand, saying, we shall overcome. It, it just boggles your mind. The same state, and like you said earlier in the week, where Walter Scott was gunned down in his back. I'll mute my line. Thanks for taking the call. Right on, Mr. Denver Four. Um, any of the other folks that have a hand up, if you all have comments you would like to share, feel free. Line should be open. Good evening, everyone. It's Carmen in Texas. Good evening, guys. Um, and the other callers. I I wasn't going to start where I'm starting, but since but I had I I was feeling Mr. Den before. I'm like I have to go back for some reason. The co the cohesion starts a little bit further back than where we started today, and so I was a little bit on Chapter 16 when she first went underground. And she said that her best, she thought that the best way to fight the system when you're underground would actually be leading the double life, to have a regular nine to five job during the day and then, you know, going out and doing other things and being really careful not to leave any trails. And I don't know, I thought about that and I thought about that. I don't think we're that good. I don't know. I just, and for some reason, I'm like, is that going to work? I just, I mean, I'm, I know that we need to use lies. I know we need to use lies much, 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 much more than we do. So maybe, maybe that would work. Maybe so. I don't know. But then again, I, I paid attention to her statement. It's really, you know, it's like a blow when it said, um, that, you know, every other week I was hearing about somebody disappearing, you know, and the police were coming back down so hard on the black community, it seemed like the entire black community was on the FBI's most wanted list. And I guess that's true. And I think the only people who don't know that is us. We are all we are all on the FBI's most wanted list. And 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 then you know, and then there's a part about the lies. You know, she said, "Oh, she wasn't too worried because, as far as she was concerned, she was just wanted for questioning." Well, of course, the IFBI would say that. They would say, "We just want you for questioning. Just come on in. It's no big deal. It's just questioning." They lie. They lie. They lie. I, you know, until we understand that they only have the two weapons in their repertoire, you know, lies and violence, that's it, you know, lies and violence, I guess it's, we'll never get it, but it, everything they tell you, you should always be suspicious that it is a lie, you know, and she was like, oh, you know, I'm just wanting for questioning, and then the part when she was talking about what Mr. Jimmy Floor was talking about when she was on the train, you know, she said she was like uh, berating herself because she left so very early, and there was no one on the train except a couple of white guys and all of these black women in wigs. And I said, oh, that, must get, that must be where they get the support for that lie about, you know, black people, white people get up and go to work every day and you never look around and see any black people going to work. You know, they must be at home in bed and living off the government teeth and all this other stuff because, you know, if they can make it sound good because they don't see any black people when they go to work because we've already gotten up hours before that and gone to work. So it makes it really easy for them to tell themselves that lie that, you know, black people never get up and go to work. When they think on, so, um, and if anybody thinks to remember that point we did, um, county events and the fifth, I guess stanza, and it, and I just don't understand. I, I read it and read it. I just can't understand it. It says, and I still can't stand old El Dorado, and I still can't dig no one and one, and I just don't understand what those two sentences mean. And I, I've tried all week. Um, you know, she's talking about, she said, okay, we need overall ideology, we need strategy, 
and, you know, scientific analysis and history and present conditions and all this other stuff. There are just so few conditions where white people got up and packed their bags and left. As far as I can tell, there are only two, and I think, I suspect one of those is a lie. So that's, there's not much to draw on that. And as far as overall ideology, there's just, you know, white people are awful. Why can't we just get it out there? White people are awful. We, we always want to say, we want to say anything else, but white people are just awful. Stay away from them. They're poisonous. You know, I think we, we, oh, we make it too complicated. Okay, I guess this is my last thing. But um, it's just what Mr. Dimley Ford was pointing out when he was talking about um, the flexibility that white people have with the rules they make up, you know. Sometimes, okay. I tell you, there are no rules. No, there's no such thing as a rule. I mean, if white people say that, you know, you you must, you must walk. You know, or you don't have to walk. You you just if you would just challenge that and say you just made that up. There is no no. You just made that up. You know, if you would challenge a lot of these rules, and like you said, Gus, when police roll up on you and stuff, and you say, I'm sorry, I really can't consent to that. If you would challenge these things that they want to put out there as rules, a lot of them just fall like a house of cards because they make them up on the spot, and they don't even know what the rule is any, anyway because they break them all day long, so they really don't have any firm idea what the rule is. And, um, okay, so this is the last thing. When they were saying they were looking for ballistics experts and forensic chemists, I'm saying, you know, these are probably the same group of clowns in the FBI who came out and said, well, you know, all of our hair and fiber stuff, all that was a lie. Eh, all, that, all that nuance, this, this crazy stuff we made up. I bet a lot of the ballistics stuff is crazy. I bet a lot of, a lot of the chemistry stuff is crazy, too. And they don't know what they're doing. Even, even, even if it's not crazy, they're too stupid to know how to do it. So... I'm thinking I'm going to be looking at those really closely from now on, ballistic stuff and, and, uh, and, and chemistry stuff. I bet those crazy people have no idea what they're doing, and they're lying about that, too. Yeah, that's it. All the folks who had a hand up wanted to get their comments in. Thank you, Kindly Karma. Uh, other folks who had a hand up uh, have comments. Hmm. Ready? Uh, not sure if. Uh... Oh, can I be heard? <laughs> oh, yes, sir. We can hear you. <laughs> I was I was I was muted. Okay, uh, greetings. Uh, I was uh, over the uh, this, the, the past uh, reading. I was uh, uh, reminded of two things. Uh, what the main one is how she was she was ex- ex- explaining the complexities of. Uh, "Quote unquote," what is called organizing and of these different uh, uh, groups and versions of groups, uh, with the idea in mind of of fighting the system of racial and white supremacy. And basically, what I get out of it, it tells me that the best means, best possible means that I can think of, is is codification, counter racist codification. Uh, and the question would come, well, who do you organize? You organize yourself around that concept uh, of uh, counter-racist uh, codification. And uh, in turn, uh, because I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have met anybody on this line <laughs> if it wasn't for that process. It, 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 and, and in a sense, we are strangers. And in a sense, we, from a constructive means, I think, have contact with one another. And I don't think anything is better than that as far as what I can think of right now, uh, as far as that concern. Uh, and I also think within that, it, uh, you know, it, it's something that the system of racism probably would have a hard time with and or eventually get defeated. Um Ooh, there's something else, but I forgot. Uh, but uh, 
what 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 was your suggestion on about the um uh, about the uh uh South Carolina situation on speaking on it today? Uh, that, you know, I'm not really looking for uh, tangents or people have uh, kind of oh, okay. speeches and things. <laughs> just if, speech, okay. <laughs> right. If, if anything in the book this week, I said, just be mindful. If anything yeah. in the book, you know, relates to it, then point that out. But not not anything. Just people want to talk about that. Yeah. Well, I briefly I heard I heard a, a, a prior a caller speak about, uh, I think, the uh, flag, quote unquote, rebel flag. Uh, and. Let's face it. There, there are flags all over the world, <laughs> uh, and uh, the the only what I the, the most the most constructive uh, version of a flag that I could think of is, is only the one that Mister Fuller uh, thinks about uh, has said about is, is one with a question mark on it. <laughs> as far as uh, because that's where we at as far as. Uh, I think uh, from a uh, truthful standpoint, uh, is a big question mark because the the the, the other one uh, is it, represented uh, as much uh, much uh, uh, global white supremacy. It, it, matter of fact, it it it, it involves more <laughs> the global white supremacy than uh, the one they're speaking about. Uh, but I, I do understand the uh, the the. the uh, somewhat of the concept of people who are against it uh, to a point, but uh, that's just another point on it also as far as the, the other version of a flag that's popular in this part of the world. I mean, there's, there's even more than just those two, but those are the two main ones. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's all I have to say for right now. Right on. Uh, if other folks have comments that they uh, want to make sure they get in, feel free. Chime in. Uh, number 760-569-7676. And the code again is 564-943-POUND. Press star 6 if you would like to participate. Uh, number one, I uh, lost a few cool points, not all, but a few. Uh, the anecdote that uh, Mr. Demery Ford shared about uh, the Honorable Judge Bruce Wright. Um, we had discussed that before. Uh, folks who've been listening uh, back in 2013, right after... Uh, the conclusion to Trayvon Martin's murder trial. Uh, We were talking about it because one of the perspective books that we were going to read was Black Robes, White Justice by Bruce Wright. Um, We thought that would be a good book to read for law. I'm looking at it right now. I can't, uh, that would have been a real shame if I had not uh, mentioned that before we got done with the book. But yeah, folks should check out uh, his text, Black and White, or excuse me, Black Robes, White Justice, Why Our Legal System doesn't work for blacks. Uh, Sada Shakur could have titled her book the same thing, but uh, perhaps maybe this is a potential for our next book read to follow up with uh, with this one. But folks should check that out. Great, uh, great reading material about white supremacy and law. Um, also, uh, to Miss, uh, I'm trying to make sure I get my who referenced it uh, with Cointel Pro and uh, Karma's point about black people. I mean, literally like that's not an exaggeration. Like that's like documented. Uh, we talked about that. Dr. Kenneth O'Reilly in his book, racial matters, the FBI's secret file on black America from 1960 to 1972. Uh, that was one of his very first points on the program that, uh, the, it's not just, you know, an individual, uh, black person, or if you're a loud mouth or (laughs) uppity black person that you're going to be, uh, under uh, surveillance and people keeping white people keeping tabs on you it's any black person and the logic was we know how we treat black people their loyalties are suspects so certainly all of them are going to be under surveillance we know eventually that they're going to figure out you know the gist of what's going on and they're going to be trying to work against us so we got to be alert got to be vigilant um, but and this played right on through in the 1960s uh, he documents that it was not just 
people like Asada Shakur or in the Black Panthers or the Black Liberation Army, if you were a black person and you just went to an NAACP meeting, that would be enough to warrant that you could end up on some of these lists uh, and, you know, having people surveilling you and having people making it difficult for you to get a job and things of that nature. You didn't have to be a firebrand talking about off the pig and this, that, and the other. You just went to a meeting, <laughs> what was going to be said. Um, just it, it totally, literally was and is. If you are a black person, you are under surveillance, which again is why I just I laugh when people talk about Edward Snowden. Um, let's see. The making up laws point, she talked about that uh, in the text, and then people referenced that in their comment section uh, as well. She talked about that in the video segment that I was referencing, the 1997 conference that's uh, available that I think you should watch. She talks about how, and it's very similar to Mumia Abu Jamal for people who've been uh, following uh, his situation in Pennsylvania, where they, you know, crafted these uh, Governor Corbett crafted these new laws uh, to try to restrict his ability to speak on the air and do commencement addresses and that sort of thing, saying that it was uh, it was further harming the victims, right? And they tried to do the same thing with Asada Shakur in making up these new laws after she escaped and she, she said one of the first things that she wanted to do when she got to Cuba was to write and when the book was about to be published, uh, she talks about how in the state of New Jersey, white people tried to uh, craft laws uh, so that her book couldn't be published. And apparently um, other white people uh, did not approve uh, of what they were going to try to do to keep her book from being published. So it ended up that, you know, they didn't, th these did not, these uh, suggestions didn't become law, but just to emphasize that white people, they will do whatever they want. If that means making up new laws, fine. Uh, if that means making up new laws specifically for you, fine. If that means that we have to ignore and violate our own professed laws in order to get you, fine. Whatever, whatever we have to do, we will make it happen. Um, the prison gang uh, situation, that's, you know, still being a big issue right now. I think Randy Blazak talked about that uh, and folks going to print Angela King, even our uh, recent guest this week, former uh, so-called skinhead, uh, but white people going into prison and, and really intensifying uh, their practice of racism, white supremacy in a crude and often violent manner, and then getting out uh, and continuing uh, their mayhem. Uh, there have been several reports uh, talking about that, particularly over the last I think 10 to 15 years uh, and how that the danger, uh, the threat that that represents all of these uh, with the extreme radical uh, white racist <laughs> enclaves that have got all these criminal elements. And that was good to hear that from the female side as well, because I think most of the time that's definitely a, a male thing to Mr. Demery Forrest's point. People don't think of uh, white chicks in racist prison gangs. I don't think that that's going down and it, it absolutely is. Um, see some of the other points that she touched on, man, it tied in beautifully that, that the segment that I chose the audio segment at the beginning from that video, which I keep saying people should watch. Um, she, she talks about, uh, the importance and the pain, the strain that all of this has had on her family. Like she goes, and I think, uh, in the documentary eyes on the rainbow as well, she talks about, the strain. In fact, she says in Eyes on the Rainbow that they filmed that documentary the day that her mother passed away. And she talks about the pain of this separation, her being out of the country so long, and then before that, her being incarcerated in greater confinement uh, for a number of years and on the run, harassed and everything. And she, she talked about how her mom had a heart attack after she escaped because the police would come and just bang on her door and disturb her and just constant harassment. Where's your daughter? You're having information and, you know, have you talked to her? Blah, blah, blah. Just all of this stuff. Just harass, harass led to her having a heart attack. But she talks about the immense strain that this placed on, uh, but not just her as an individual, but her entire family uh, and the importance of healing uh, individually uh, as a family. Spiritually, I thought that was so important and just the scene from the book this week where she uh, describes her daughter 
being with her in greater confinement and saying, you know, you, you're not trying hard enough or you don't want to be here. You could get out if you wanted to. And just, just that whole excruciating, uh, scene, uh, which folks have, you know, talked about, written about just the impact that that has on, uh, the total collective, not just an individual, uh, black person and, and the significance of healing, uh, that, certainly could be echoed with everything this week focused on South Carolina. And I think we've even talked about before, it's difficult to even get to a space of uh, healing because you're constantly being traumatized. Folks were still trying to heal from the Walter Scott situation in South Carolina. And now this, or the friendship nine uh, situation from some years ago. And now this, you never really get that opportunity because there's always uh, some, some new harm uh, to remedy. Uh, but I just, I thought that was a really important scene. Um, let's see, almost, I will, I will stop there. Uh, just if other folks have other comments they want to get in or for other people who haven't, haven't shared yet. If you all have anything you want to offer as well, feel free. We still have about, uh, maybe 15, 15, 20 minutes, uh, before we get to the second audio segment. Any of the folks that are with us have any any other comments they wanted to get in or if anybody could help karma. I think she said she was confused about a couple of the lines in the poem. Uh, if anybody has uh, other responses they would like to offer, feel free. Yes, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Um, about Karma's uh, question, you know, I, I guess I kind of just went past that, but the one-on-one, -on -one, you know, I, that's a phrase that was, you know, I, it, I could be mistaken, but, you know, the one-on-one, the -on -one, you know, was kind of a uh, phrase used, you know, during that time, that was uh, indulgence in uh, drugs, cocaine, and being a one and one was uh, a couple of lines that you would, you know, snort in each nostril. You know, I don't know if that's what she meant by that, but that was... You know, that was one of the uh, definitions of a, a one and one. But uh, I'm glad that uh, Ms. Shakur wrote this book. I think that in your, your opening uh, uh, commentary, she said that she almost, well, she didn't want to write the book. I'm glad she did. If she hadn't, you know, we would still be in the dark. Or so to speak, we would we would not know, you know, exactly what went on and why she was, you know, treated as such, and what actually happened that night on the New Jersey Turnpike. You know, I have a lot of respect for her. The book, the chapters has no titles. I noticed. I don't know if that has any significance. But the stuff that she endured, you know, denied her freedom for over six years. She was denied the right to raise her daughter, her mother. She wasn't able to visit her mother's funeral. <clears throat> Even denied a uh, business of her new granddaughter. But yet she remained committed to seeking justice. And throughout all that she endured, she kept her sanity and her humanity intact. And I think that that was a phenomenal accomplishment. Um, based upon the dire, dire straight uh, situation she was in, having to be put in the solitary confinement, and then to know that she said she had probably one in a million 
chance of being acquitted of the charges that she was charged with, knowing that she didn't have any finance to pay for her legal defense. And she mentioned some celebrities that, you know, uh, contributed to the fundraising. I think that's what kept, uh, you know, uh, kept the legal defense going was the fundraising and the efforts of, you know, well-meaning people that understood, a little less confused with the system that we we're under and knew that, uh, like uh, Mr. Haynes was saying, it was a legal lynching and a kangaroo court. So, and I'm glad that it's out there for people to know about and that anybody after they read her autobiography, if they don't see and understand how this system can take an innocent person and then turn them into the most vile and vicious uh, person in America and then take the most vile and vicious person in America and just call him a madman. You know, it's it's just amazing. But uh, I'll mute my line and give somebody else a chance to uh, uh, give some comment that they wasn't able to give. Hmm. Uh, just real quick on the entertainers, where she talks about that to help you know keep the momentum going and fundraising and all that. Uh, two of the entertainers mentioned uh, made their transition during 2014. Uh, Mary Baraka and Ruby D. Uh, we talked about them last year, but just again to highlight the uh, the losses from 2014. Uh, lots of uh, black people who did quite a bit, contributed quite a bit to efforts towards black liberation and replacing white supremacy with justice um, exited in 2014. Um, I just was going to get in really quick as well. Also really uh, appreciated. I think it's black self-respect on display uh, when she was talking about being, when she was in the prison system and those uh, racist white uh, women that were in prison, uh, just, you know, letting it be known that, uh, I am not all into nonviolence and, uh, you can lose your life. Uh, anything directed at me, uh, I'm taking it that I need to defend my life to the maximum. Uh, and if that means one of you or two of you are no longer on the planet, so be it. I thought that was great and black self-respect. Uh, and just also, I think when she talks about the, uh, black liberation army, not being a big centralized group, I just I think it's very easy for white people to control groups when you have uh, any sort of organization. And it's it's going to be a body with a lot of people, and either it's for wall for for wallism, as Mister Fuller talks, or just by the nature of having a lot of people in it. Uh, it's just it's very easy for white people to control and manipulate that sort of endeavor. Uh, I think the record shows that my assessment could be an error, but I don't think so. And I think any any anything like that, I think it would just be very easy um, for white people to either uh, infiltrate, uh, electronically infiltrate, to either have what they call infiltrators, provocateurs, uh, to go in and be disruptive. Sometimes they'll go in and send them to do criminal uh, things, so then they'll be justified in raiding and arresting. Uh, the group, sometimes it'll just be spy. Sometimes it'll be cause mischief. And I mean, they just have an assortment of strategies, uh, that have proven to be extremely efficient, uh, at neutralizing, obstructing, uh, groups, collectives, uh, of black people, non-white people. So that would be in, and might even be further evidence to support, uh, why Mr. Fuller takes the stance that any sort of counterviolent offensive or even the code book period is united independent, not so much 
about what a whole lot of non-white people can, you know, come together and try and do as a group or collective, uh, but what you as an individual can do that white people under current conditions seems to be, seem to have a little bit more difficulty uh, dealing with an individual codified non-white person trying to work against racism as opposed to a whole group that's in a, in a building or something of that, something of that nature. Uh, if that makes sense, uh, folks, if it doesn't make sense, certainly speak up or, you know, if you just have a different opinion, uh, feel free to share on that as well. That was that was exactly what I was referring to uh, with what I think she was uh, without, you know, quoting anything on Mr. Fuller on what uh, Mr. Kuro was uh, speaking about, the different uh, complexities that exist and uh, attempting to solve the problem of racism, white supremacy with, with these uh, uh, different, many, many different organizations. I mean, right presently today, uh, white people have, for the, for the most part, have left a lot of places as far as uh, from a government standpoint, quote unquote government standpoint in places that, but they still control the place, uh, such as Haiti, uh, a lot of places in Africa, uh, the place formerly known as Rhodesia, uh, they, they're still there, you know, so, and there's plenty, plenty of efforts that have, that have been made by a lot of brave people, including herself. Uh, that have really uh, risked their lives and a lot have lost their lives uh, to no prevail because uh, the system of racism and white supremacy is equipped to destroy uh, such type of organized efforts within about 15 minutes after it's formed. And Mr. Fuller does give good examples of, of how that takes place. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that that paragraph, I think she she lays it out really well uh, in that paragraph, just talking about how being courageous and dedicated, that that's not sufficient, uh, that it takes mm -hmm. logic to solve this mm -hmm. problem, which is absolute scientific analysis. Logic is what is going to be required. I also uh, thought it was really important. In fact, it reminded me of the first time. I read this book, um, the segment, it's right before the end of the last chapter, I guess that's chapter 21, uh, where she says that, uh, people, people just think oppression is the normal state of things after a while, uh, where she says, I, I, re I can read the whole, uh, whole paragraph every day now, every day out in the street. Now I remind myself that black people in America are oppressed. It's necessary that I do that. People get used to anything. The less you think about your oppression, the more your tolerance for it grows. After a while, people just think oppression is the normal state of things. But to become free, you have to be acutely aware of being a slave. Really, really, that paragraph, I remember the first time that I read this book, it was like, whoa, <laughs> like, uh, just hearing that. And now it's like, oh, that reminds me a lot of Mr. Fuller. <laughs> like, uh, if I'm a slave, call me a slave. And, and even Harriet Tubman, uh, where she says, I freed uh, thousands of slaves and could have freed thousands more if they had only known that they were slaves. Uh, the Just the importance of black self-respect is not lying uh, to ourselves about our predicament. Uh, but even before all of that, just how people uh, get accustomed to things. I think the way Mr. Fuller often explains it, if you're born in a prison, then that kind of warps your understanding of what a prison is uh, and the incorrectness of it and how you, you know, you should not want to be there. You should be upset uh, about being in prison. But if you're born there, you don't have that perspective. Uh, and I think for a lot of us, just not thinking about racism, not thinking about the power that white people wield over our lives. I think exactly as she said, I think it just, it makes it easier 
uh, to just desensitize and whatever. You just you just get accustomed to it and roll on like it's nothing until an event like this week happens and and that kind of disrupts things for a while. But that's I think that is I think that's huge. I think it's something to keep in mind. Uh, just how for a lot of times when we get frustrated and don't have the patience to deal with other uh, other victims, uh, maybe keep that paragraph uh, in mind. I know Dr. Welsing yesterday, she was talking about us being in denial. When you have people that are resistant to truth, um, sometimes it can be, it can be difficult uh, for them to, to digest uh, accurate, honest information. So you kind of have to keep that in mind. But I thought that was great, great passage that I think some other folks mentioned as well. Uh, The caller at four, five, eight, six. Did you have commentary you want to offer also? Four, five, eight, six. Don't have coming at the moment. Okay. Any other thoughts before uh, we get to the second audio segment? Anything else folks wanted to share? I guess I had a question I'd like to pose you, uh, in your caller. Uh, do you think that, you know, some of the people that she mentioned, that she had respect for were feminists and basically the feminist movement was run and made it was maintained, supported, you know, by white women. And I do believe that, you know, women have suffered uh you know, in this society, but um, you know, I I just happen to feel personally that if you are black and a female, then your first priority would be towards you know black liberation. But I was just one of my question is, uh, do you think that she uh, came to uh, a conclusion about that? feminist movement and the fact that some of those leaders were uh, lesbian and uh, which uh, some of them that she uh, name called as nigger lovers, you know, even involved in in some of the black revolutionary uh, activities, but uh, not being totally committed. Do you think she had come to a conclusion about that or that she, uh, or what do you think your views are on, her views about the uh, feminist movement during that time? Hmm. Uh, I would say, uh, in terms of if she came to a view on that, I'm not sure uh, in terms of her assessment of the, particularly the white women that were involved in the whole feminist uh, movement. Uh, I have not heard her give like a critique on uh, feminism uh, or particularly white women that were in all involved in all that. So I don't know if, if she, if she, had a conclusion about that or if that conclusion changed uh, with time, like if, you know, what, what her stance would be on all of that now. Um, I know I am of the opinion. I'm reminded of the uh, biography of Ann Braden, who was one of those quote unquote, well-meaning white people uh, during, during this same time period. And in her biography, the author talks about how during this period, as the quote unquote black power movement, as it was called, as that was waning, that is when the ascendancy of women's liberation or whatever you want to call it, that as the women's movement was rising, the black power movement was waning. And I remember we talked about, you know, that is not coincidence that that is just another facet of of what white people do to distract things, um, to get you off and focused on this and to divert attention to divert energy 
uh, away from people focusing on the war of racism, white supremacy. That might not be her assessment. I'm not sure if folks uh, have seen where she's given some talks or what have you on that. That would be great to know, but I don't, I don't really know what her, uh, her assessment is on all that. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From the more, uh, like I said, the video, the one that I've seen, that's more recent. It's like 1997. Um, it still sounded like, and I think she said in the book, not this week, but some of the previous sessions that we've done where she's, uh, made comments, basically suggesting that she, um, even though she definitely, and she emphasized, I think explicitly that she, thinks that black people need to work amongst themselves and solve their own issues. And, and once that has been uh, thoroughly done, then yes, she would be uh, with working for uh, white people that say, you know, they're for real and, and are doing the work uh, demonstrating that they're not with racism, that she would be down for, for working with them. So at least from some of those type of statements, it seems like she still uh, might be holding out uh, space for some redeemable white people that might be okay. Um, I don't know, just some of the, it was a lot of white people, uh, at least to me, they look like white people uh, at the workshop in 97 that were <clears throat> speaking with her and asking questions and things. So it seems like, you know, she might still hold out room for some some good white men and women, uh, unfortunately, but I, I could be in error. Anybody else have thoughts on that? Uh I can I can recall uh, reading some of Miss Davis's uh, comments on similar subjects. I mean Angela Davis uh, and Miss Shakur's. I've only really heard it in this particular book, and it, it but it's, it sounds somewhat similar, but it's still not enough for me to give a a very accurate. Um, uh, identification uh, on where she's at with with with, with that. Uh, uh, other than I, other than uh, uh, other than I can say that uh, you know any any uh, organization uh, that is controlled by by white people, uh, whether it's white males or white females or both, uh, it should be a uh, distrusting. Uh, uh, thoughts when it comes to uh, anything that they have to uh, put out and they, and they want to invite us into. Uh, and for the oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I think we got some background noise uh, from... Oh, I, I, <clears throat> I, 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 I need to hear, hear something, yeah. Yeah, but that, that's my my take on it. I, I I do recall the the brief statement that she made uh, in in the prior uh, portion of reading, and it, it, it sounds somewhat similar. Uh, both had somewhat negative experiences in the uh, uh, well. She had it directly in the Black Panther Party, but Miss Davis, one of the reasons why she never joined the Black Panther Party uh, was because of of uh, she felt that that there were some instances where females were not treated correctly. And you know when, when you know black black ladies are, are mistreated a, a whole lot, so it's easy for, in my mind, easy for a, a very slick white female to come into that equation. And uh, have some sort of uh, influence with uh, non-white black females, even sexually, from that standpoint. Although I'm not saying that with, with about Mr. Shakur now. I'm just saying in general. When she mentioned uh, some of the poets 
June Jordan. You can probably get another cowbell on that. And Audrey Lord. <clears throat> One of them, I believe it was Miss Jordan, had uh, met a Columbia student while she was in in college herself, and she had uh, had a relationship with a white man. Uh, I don't. I, I believe she married him. I'm, I'm not totally positive, but she attributed that experience with bringing her into a consciousness about uh, racism in America because she had went to, I believe, all white schools or she was not well informed on uh, the extent of the racism in America. But that opened her eyes, just uh, that experience, which probably, you know, turned into a tragedy. That's why we call them tragic relationships. But uh, th- those were interesting people, though, brilliant, brilliant individuals that definitely uh, contributed to uh, uh, lightening the uh or bring enlightening the struggle of oppressed people, you know, in America. I'll be fine. Anything else? Folks want to make sure they get in. Uh, almost ready for our second audio segment. Uh, any last comments before we get to the clip? assume folks are good uh, if you had other comments if you uh, weren't able to call in or had comments you wanted to make sure we get in again this is our final session so anything you want to make sure you share before we wrap up with the book uh, concluding comments or major themes major takeaway points uh, from the text make sure you get it in uh, we will be all done after this segment uh, this is the postscript for the book uh, it is uh, of significant length so <laughs> and will be uh, good to hear the conclusion. Context of White Supremacy, the autobiography of Asada Shakur. Final audio segment. Postscript. Freedom. I couldn't believe that it had really happened, that the nightmare was over, that finally the dream had come true. I was elated, ecstatic, but I was completely disoriented. Everything was the same, yet everything was different. All of my reactions were super intense. I submerged myself in patterns and and textures, sucking in smells and sounds as if each day was my last. I felt like a voyeur. I forced myself not to stare at the people whose conversations I strained to overhear. Suddenly, I was flooded with the horrors of prison and every disgusting experience that somehow I had been able to minimize while inside. I had developed the ability to be patient, calculating, and completely self-controlled. For the most part, I had been incapable of crying. I felt rigid, as though chunks of steel and concrete had worked themselves into my body. I was cold. I strained to touch my softness. I was afraid that prison had made me ugly. My comrades helped a lot. They were so beautiful, natural, and healthy. I loved them for their kindness to me. It had been years since I had communicated with anyone intensely, and I talked to them almost compulsively. They were like medicine, helping me ease back into myself again. But I had changed, and in so many ways. I was no longer the wide-eyed, romantic, young revolutionary who believed the revolution was just around the corner. I still appreciated energetic idealism, but, but I had long ago become so convinced that revolution was a science. Generalities were no longer enough for me. Like my comrades, I believe that a higher level of political sophistication was necessary and that unity in the black community had to become a priority. We could never afford to forget the lessons we had learned from COINTELPRO. As far as I was concerned, building a sense of national consciousness was one of the most important tasks that lay ahead of us. 
I couldn't see how we could seriously struggle without having a strong sense of collectivity, without being responsible for each other and to each other. It was also clear to me that without a truly internationalist component, nationalism was reactionary. There was nothing revolutionary about nationalism by itself. Hitler and Mussolini were nationalists. Any community seriously concerned with its own freedom has to be concerned about other people's freedom as well. The victory of oppressed people anywhere in the world is a victory for black people. Each time one of the imperialism's tentacles is cut off, we are closer to liberation. The struggle in South Africa is the most important battle of the century for black people. The defeat of apartheid in South Africa will bring Africans all over the planet closer to liberation. Imperialism is an international system of exploitation, and we, as revolutionaries, need to be internationalists to defeat it. Havana. Lazy sun against blue-green ocean. A beautiful city of narrow, spiderweb streets on one side of town and broad, tree-lined avenues on the other. Houses with peeling paint and vintage U.S. cars from the 40s and 50s. It's a busy place, full of buses, people hurrying, kids in wine or gold-colored uniforms walking leisurely down the streets, swinging book bags. The first thing that hit me were the open doors. Everywhere you go, doors are open wide. You see people inside their homes talking, working, or watching television. I was amazed that you could actually walk down the streets at night alone. Old people strolling slowly, carrying shopping bags, stop to ask, ¿Qué hay? ¿Qué hay en la mercada? What are they selling in the market? Without a moment's hesitation, they yell at kids to get out of the street. They stand with their hands on their hips, acting like they own the place. I guess they do. They're not afraid. Es mentira, my neighbors exclaim. It's a lie. ¿Qué mentirosa tú eres? What a liar you are. My neighbors ask me what the U.S. is like, and they accuse me of lying when I tell them about the hunger and cold and people sleeping in the streets. They refuse to believe me. How can that be in such a rich country? I tell them about drug addicts and child prostitutes, about crime in the streets. They accuse me of exaggerating. We know capitalism is not a good system, but you don't have to exaggerate. Are there really 12-year-old drug addicts? Even though they know about racism and the Ku Klux Klan, about unemployment, such things are unreal to them. Cuba is a country of hope. Their reality is so different. I'm amazed at how much Cubans have accomplished in so short a time since the revolution. There are new buildings everywhere, schools, apartment houses, clinics, hospitals, and daycare centers. They are not like the skyscrapers going up in midtown Manhattan. There are no exclusive condominiums or luxury office buildings. There, the new buildings are for the people. Medical care, dental care, and hospital visits are free. Schools at all educational levels are free. Rent is no more than about 10% of salaries. There are no taxes, no income, city, federal, or state taxes. It is so strange to pay the price actually listed on products without any tax added. Movies, plays, concerts, and sports events all over cost one or two pesos at the most. Museums are free. On Saturdays and Sundays, the streets are packed with people dressed up and ready to hang out. I was amazed to discover that such a small island has such a rich cultural life and is so lively, particularly when the U.S. press gives just about the opposite picture. I'm being introduced at a party. The hostess tells me the man is from El Salvador. I hold out my hand to shake his. A few seconds too late, I realize he is missing an arm. He asks me what country I am from. I'm so upset and ashamed, I'm almost shaking. Yo soy de los Estados Unidos, pero no soy Yankee, I tell him. A friend of mine had taught me that phrase. Every time someone asked me where I was from, I cringed. I hated to tell people I was from the U.S., I would have preferred to say I was New African, except that hardly anyone would have understood what that meant. When I read about death squads in El Salvador or the bombing of hospitals in Nicaragua, I felt like screaming. Too many people in the U.S. support death and destruction without being aware of it. They indirectly support the killing of people without ever having to look at the corpses. But in Cuba, I could see the results of U.S. foreign policy. Torture victims on crutches who came from other countries to Cuba for treatment, including Namibian children who had survived massacres, and evidence of the vicious aggression the U.S. government had committed against Cuba, including sabotage and numerous assassination attempts against Fidel. I wondered how all those people in the states who tried to sound tough, saying that the U.S. should go here, bomb there, take over this, attack that, would feel if they knew they were indirectly responsible for babies being burned to death. I wondered how they would feel if they were forced to take moral responsibility for that. 
It sometimes seems that people in the States are so accustomed to watching death on eyewitness news, watching people starve to death in Africa, being tortured to death in Latin America, or shot down on Asian streets, that somehow, for them, people across the ocean, people up there or down there or over there, are not real. One of the first questions on the minds of blacks from the States when they come to Cuba is whether or not racism exists. I was certainly no exception. I had read a little about the history of black people in Cuba and knew that it was very different from the history of black people in the States. Cuban racism had not been as violent or as institutionalized as U.S. racism, and the tradition of the two races, blacks and whites, fighting together for liberation, first from colonialization and later from dictatorship, was much stronger in Cuba. Cuba's first war for independence began in 1868, when Carlos Manuel de Cespedes freed his slaves and encouraged them to join the army in the fight against Spain. One of the most important figures in that war was Antonio Mako, a black man who was the chief military strategist. Blacks played a crucial role in Cuba's labor movement in the 1950s. Jesus Menendez and Lazaro Peña led two key unions. I knew that blacks like Juan Almeida, now commandant of the revolution, had played a significant role in the revolutionary struggle to overthrow Batista, but I was most interested in learning what had happened to blacks after the triumph of the revolution. I spent my first weeks in Havana walking and watching. Nowhere did I find a segregated neighborhood, but several people told me that where I was living had been all white before the revolution. Just from casual observation, it was obvious that race relations in Cuba were different from what they were in the U.S. Blacks and whites could be seen together everywhere. In cars, walking down streets, kids of all races played together. It was definitely different. Whenever I met someone who spoke English, I asked their opinion about the race situation. Racism is illegal in Cuba, I was told. Many shook their heads and said, Aquí no hay racismo. There is no racism here. Although I heard the same response from everyone, I remained skeptical and suspicious. I couldn't believe it was possible to eliminate hundreds of years of racism just like that, in 25 years or so. To me, revolutions were not magical, and no magic wand could be waved to create changes overnight. I had come to see revolution as a process. I eventually became convinced that the Cuban government was completely committed to eliminating all forms of racism. There were no racist institutions, structures, or organizations, and I understood how the Cuban economic system undermined rather than fed racism. I had assumed that blacks would be working from within the revolution to implement the changes and to ensure the continuation of non-racist policies that Fidel and the revolutionary leaders had instituted in every aspect of Cuban life. A black Cuban friend helped me have a better understanding. He told me that Cubans took their African heritage for granted, that for hundreds of years, Cubans had danced to African rhythms, performed traditional rituals, and worshipped gods like Shango and Oban. He told me that Fidel, in a speech, had told people, we are all Afro-Cubans, from the very lightest to the very darkest. I told him that I thought it was the duty of Africans everywhere on this planet to struggle to reverse the historical patterns created by slavery and imperialism. Although he agreed with me, he quickly informed me that he didn't think of himself as an African. Yo soy Cubano. I am Cuban. And it was obvious that he was very proud of being Cuban. He told me a story about a white Cuban who had volunteered twice to fight in Angola. He had received awards for heroism. His case is not at all common in Cuba, but there are some who have problems adjusting to change. What was his problem? I asked. When the guy came home, he caused a big scandal with his family. His daughter wanted to marry a black man, and he opposed the marriage. He said he wanted his grandchildren to look like him. It was a big argument, and his whole family got into it. The guy was so mixed up, he went crazy when his daughter called him a racist. He wanted to fight everybody. He went out into the street, crying and kicking lampposts. He didn't know what to do. All the time he was in Angola fighting against racism. All the time he was fighting in Angola against racism, he never thought about his own racism. I agreed with him that whites fighting against racism had to fight on two levels, against institutionalized racism and against their own racist ideas. What happened to that man? I asked. Well, his daughter got married anyway, and his family convinced him to go to the wedding. Now he babysits for his grandchildren, and he says he's crazy about them, but the guy is still not right in the head. Every time I see him, he's apologetic. I told him, I don't want his apologies. Let him apologize to his daughter and her husband. As long as he supports the revolution, I don't care what he thinks. I care more about what he does. If he really supports the revolution, then he's going to change. And even if he never changes, his kids are going to change. And his grandchildren will change even more. That's what I care about. 
The whole race question in Cuba was even more confusing to me because all the categories of race were different. In the first place, most white Cubanos wouldn't even be considered white in the U.S. They'd be considered Latinos. I was shocked to learn that a lot of Cubans who looked black to me didn't consider themselves black. They called themselves mulattoes, colorados, yabaos, and a whole bunch of other names. It seemed to me that anyone who wasn't jet black was considered mulatto. The first time someone called me a mulata, I was so insulted that if I had been able to express myself in Spanish, we would have had a heated argument right there on the spot. Yo no soy una mulata. Yo soy una mujer negra y orgullosa. I would tell people as soon as I had learned a little Spanish. I am not a mulatto, but a black woman, and I'm proud to be black. Some people understood where I was coming from, but others thought I was too hung up on the race question. To them, mulatto was just a color, like red, green, or blue. But to me, it represented a historical relationship. All of my associations with the word mulatto were negative. It represented slavery, slave owners raping black women. It represented a privileged caste educated in European values and culture, In some Caribbean countries, it represented the middle level of a hierarchical three-caste system, the caste that acted as a buffer class between the white rulers and the black masses. I found it impossible to separate the word from its history. It reminded me of a saying I had heard repeatedly since my childhood. If you're white, you're right. If you're brown, stick around. And if you're black, get back. I realized that in order to really understand the situation, I had to study Cuban history thoroughly. But somehow, I felt that the mulatto thing hindered Cubans from dealing with some of the negative ideas left over from slavery. The Black Pride movement had been very important in helping black people in the U.S. and in other English-speaking countries to view their African heritage in a positive light. I had never heard of any equivalent movement around mulatto pride, and I couldn't imagine what the basis for it would be. To me, it was extremely important for all the descendants of Africans everywhere on this planet to struggle to reverse the political, economic, psychological, and social patterns created by slavery and imperialism. The problem of racism takes on so many forms and displays so many subtleties. It is a complicated problem that will require much analysis and much struggle to resolve. Although, in some ways, Cubans and I approached the problem from different angles, I felt we shared the same goal, the abolition of racism all over the world. I respected the Cuban government not only for adopting non-racist principles, but for struggling to put those principles into practice. I held my breath as I waited for my aunt to pick up the phone. It had been five years since I had last spoken to her. Five years since I had been able to contact my family. Hopefully she hadn't changed her number. A click, and then, at last, I heard her voice. I was so happy. Auntie! I almost shouted. It's me, Asada. Who? Asada! Who? It's me, Asada. I'm in Cuba. I'm in Cuba. Oh, I love you. It's so good to hear your voice. How are you? The voice on the other end was my aunt's, but it was so cold, I could hardly believe it. Oh, really? Asada, hmm? Right, well, I'm fine. What's the matter, auntie? It's me, Asada. Are you all right? I'm fine. Auntie, oh, I missed you so much. It's all right. Everything's okay. I'm fine. I'm fine. How's everybody? How's everybody there? Again, the icy voice. Everything is just fine. What do you want? What do I want? What do you mean, what do I want? I want to talk to you. I love you. You sound so cold. Well, it... It... I... There was a pause. And then... Say something. So I'll know it's really you. Something only you and I know. Finally, understanding, I said the first thing that popped into my head. Auntie, auntie, Jack O'Stanty. It was a stupid childhood rhyme, and nobody else could possibly know about it. I used to taunt her with it when I was a kid. It is you. Oh my God, it really is you, she screamed. Give me a second to catch my breath. How are you? Fine, I said. How's Mommy and Kakuya? Your mother's fine. Oh, she's going to be so happy when I tell her I've talked to you. Kakuya's fine, too. Your daughter is so big, you won't recognize her. She's almost as tall as you are. I told her I wanted to call my mother and Kakuya as soon as I finished talking to her. No, you call her tomorrow. Let me call her first so she really knows it's you. Where did you say you are? Cuba. I'm calling from Cuba. I'm a political refugee here. Cuba, my aunt repeated. 
Cuba, are you okay there? I mean, are you safe? I think so, I told her. I feel fine. It seems that way. Talking to Kakuya and my mother the next day was like a dream. Hi, this little voice said into the phone. It was the most beautiful voice I'd ever heard. I was nervous and happy, sweating buckets. How are you? I asked my daughter. Fine. I felt a pot boiling over. All the feelings I kept inside for so long came gushing out. I had a million things I wanted to ask her, a million things I wanted to say. My mother and I made plans. She and my aunt and Kakuya would come down as soon as possible. It seemed too good to be true. And it was. Month after month passed by. In order for Kakuya to get a passport, she needed a birth certificate. My mother told me that for 10 years, Elmhurst Hospital had refused to issue Kakuya a birth certificate. Finally, after months of hassling, Evelyn had to go to court to get a document proving that my daughter had been born. Over the months that followed, I began to understand the kind of hell that the police and the FBI had put my family through. After I had escaped, the police had so persistently and brutally badgered my mother that she had had a heart attack. What they had done to Evelyn was beyond belief. I understood why Evelyn had reacted to my call the way she did. At one time, Evelyn's office phone had 10 intercepts on it. She and my mother received phony notes in my handwriting. They had received telephone calls with my voice telling them to come to the spot and bring some money. They had found electric eyes and all kinds of other devices in and around their houses. They had experienced strange break-ins where nothing of value was taken. But they had survived and grown stronger in the process. As the plane swooped down over Havana, it seemed that my heart was beating on my ribs to get out. My stomach hurt. My mouth was dry like cotton. It seemed like a million people poured off the plane before the tall little girl with the great big eyes started down the ramp. I could see my mother, looking frail yet so determined, with my aunt behind her looking triumphant. How much we had all gone through. Our fight had started on the slave ship years before we were born. Venceremos, my favorite word in Spanish, crossed my mind. Ten million people had stood up to the monster, Ten million people only ninety miles away. We were together in their land, my small little family, holding each other after so long. There was no doubt about it. Our people would one day be free. The cowboys and bandits didn't own the world. And with that, we are all done. Context of white supremacy. Uh, If you would like to chime in, the number to dial, 760- Five six nine seven six seven six. The code is five six four nine four three pound. Press star six if you would like to participate. That number again. Seven six zero five six nine seven six seven six. The code is five six four nine four three pound. Press star six if you would like to participate. Uh, again, we are all done. New book for next week. We will get that announced ASAP, and then. Uh, That way folks will have an opportunity to uh, get their hard copy and all that stuff moving forward. But uh, final thoughts, overarching themes, main points that will really stand out uh, about the book. Uh, Folks would like to share. Feel free. Everyone who joined us with a hand up line should be open. Uh, If you are listening in and think you might want to talk, please don't wait till the last minute. I know we've had that happen. Uh, throughout this session go ahead and get your hand up now if it's something that you think you want to share uh everyone should be with us feel free i um i'd like to thank mr denley for for clarification on that point where i said um and i still can't dig no one and one but did he say anything about the and i still can't stand ol dorado is that maybe a cigarette Anyway, that's it. Uh, 
I don't have any idea about the old El Dorado. Uh, you know, unless she was making reference to uh, Weston, it's about the only thing I can come up with on that. That might be a uh, alcoholic beverage. If it's because it's uh, the the poem, or yeah, in the poem, those lines are like back to back. When I read it, uh, the the old one to one. So if she, if Mister Demery Ford is correct, if that's a drug reference that she can't dig, you know, just get high and get drunk and you know not deal with all of this that. I could see where that could make sense, but it looks like old El Dorado is a type of uh, rum specifically. So, good job. Uh, go I was I was wondering. Uh, you know, I was reading somewhere. They said that you know when she remember when she was getting high with some other people in the park and they encountered I guess some members of the Red Guard they were Asians that were revolutionary and you know they knew that the cops were coming and so they led them out of the park and all that and somewhere it said that uh, that led her to uh, reflect inside that if she was really going to be a revolutionary then she had to start acting like one and so at that point it it became real to her that she had to uh you know change her own behavior and to become more serious with what she was doing at that time See, I think we should have uh, our narrator might be with us uh, as well. Uh, if uh, she has any comments, she wants to make sure she adds uh, join in too. Well, the other folks that are with us on the line, do y'all have any other comments or no no comments on the postscript or final final thoughts on the text on the whole. Well I don't I never knew that much about Cuba. The only time I've spoken to a Cuban person is um an attorney in New York and he he really blew me away when he said, Well, you have to realize that Cuba and Haiti would be the only black nations in the Western Hemisphere, which is why they both, I said, you think, you think Cuba would be a black, he said, yes, Cuba is mostly a bunch of black people, just like Haiti is, and he says, and that's why there can be no yield, and he says, and most people in the United States think that, um, think that Cuba is mostly white people, you know, or, or Latino people, he says, you know, given the way people in the United States are, everyone, in, most, of, most of the people in Cuba would be black to them. Almost most of Cuba would be black. And he says, and that's why the United States does not take their foot off, the, does not take its foot off the neck of Cuba. And um, I never really understood, you know, how racism worked in Cuba either. But I was very, very, very surprised about that. And... It's just an observation about Cuba. Can't wait to go. We need to get in there before the propaganda, so the white people get in there and just, you know, just start all these lies about us. Mm. 
Well, my take on that is a little different because I believe that the system of white supremacy is, is global. And so although non-white people may not be able to be racist, and racism is something that's practiced by white people, there are people who have uh, been damaged by that um, you know, colorism, the lighter, like she said, she had heard, you know, when she was growing up, what Dr. Wells would say all the time, if, you, if you're if white, you're all right. If you're yellow, you're mellow. If you're brown, stick around. But if you're black, get back. You know, I believe that colorism is, you know, global. I don't think that the racism, like, you know, we know racism exists like that, but the colorism and the fact that, you know, lighter skin, because it has to be. Why would a lot of non-whites that are not heavily melanated try to get bleaching cream and try to remain as light as possible? And I'm sure that that's in Cuba as well as some of these other Caribbean nations. Yes. Uh, after the uh, quote unquote revolution uh, that took place 90 miles from here, um, just like a, a a lot of places where the majority of of uh, the people in an area is is quote unquote non-white. There's going to be a lot of racial classification confusion amongst the victims, um, and that part of the reading is what I think that she was experiencing. Experiencing. She didn't classify it as such, you know, in a in a scientific manner. But basically, I I was just taking in on what she was saying and what was the conversation about when she was uh, 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 observing or attempting to observe on whether or not there's quote unquote racism on the island of Cuba. Uh, but I mean, it's it's identical uh, a lot of the places, you know, where there's a lot of non-white people at, and and uh, logic tells me that uh, the most confused people uh, under the system of racist white racist white supremacy are the non-white victims, and uh, so that's basically what I think she was experiencing when she was observing. Uh, to try to get an answer to that question that she had in her head, uh, that uh, you was, she was getting the results of a uh, lot of uh, non-white people who were confused on the system of racism, white supremacy, and therefore kind of like jockeying for, uh, well, I'm going to be something else other than, you know, all the, just the same thing in Brazil, you know, in other places you know, around the world where, like I said, where there's a majority of non-white uh, people at, you gonna you, you have similarities. You have similarities. A, a lot of the quote-unquote white people uh, uh, from that island is right here where, where I live at, <laughs> South Florida. Uh, they've been over here since the, you know, a lot of them have been over here since the, uh, the 1960s. I mean, it even started before then, but the majority of them came over in the 60s and the 70s. You know, in, in, order, to get, in order to get people to assist you in a quote-unquote revolution, you have to 
participate with them. You have to appease them in some sort of way. And uh, I think that with the Castro regime and the so-called revolution, that they show some attention to racism to the level that they would have non-white black people participating in in their uh, their efforts in the efforts to uh, to uh, in this revolution that it took place uh, in Cuba. But in turn, you know, it's, it's still you know still a situation where non-white black people are being mistreated. Um, in in terms of overarching things, looking kind of grim, but I, I did get the impression that non-white people were working together a lot closer. You know, even though she mentioned the white women and their liberation thing, I don't think she said that we were really. She said, oh, I understand it. But I don't think she said, oh, yes, and we worked with them and we did this with them. But I did get the impression a lot of different non-white, non-white people were working together closer. And I guess COINTELPO has just been really busy to make sure those divisions are really hard, you know, and that's what we talk about a lot because we hate one another. It seems like we fight one another so viciously and don't want to have anything to do with one another. And I just don't, I think that's recent. I think that's recent, and that's just white people. And the other thing is, is um, I looked this up in the word guide because I just assumed it just had to be there, and I missed it. But guerrilla warfare is not in there, and I'm sure that's you know that's a down on non-white people. But uh, you know they're always saying, well, if you can't go formally because you're not you know you're not weaponized enough, that we should be, all be doing guerrilla warfare. And I just don't see where that's really worked. So if infiltration pretending to be Clark Kent during the day and Superman at night didn't work, at least for us, it hasn't. And guerrilla warfare hasn't worked. Just, I think that what's going to work has just never been done before. I know we say, you know, self-respect, that's it, but Whatever it is, if that, even if that's it, it's just never been done before. Because I just don't see what works in this book. And that's what the theme is about. What works? Nothing works yet. And that was my overall impression. I think you're correct, ma'am. Uh, the only war counter war that I think is possibly effective is the one that Mr. Fuller suggested, where it's an individual that does not report it to anyone on what they're going to do, how they're going to do it, when they're going to do it, and in turn uh, act within themselves and, and only harm only those who directly have to do with it, the issue affecting uh uh, the system of racism, white supremacy, and then eliminate themselves. Uh, the folks that are with us who have not been able to share, uh, if you all had comments that you wanted to make sure you got in, you should be with us. Uh, the folks who haven't been able to share yet. Call us at uh, 9400-5234. Any other other folks? Do you all have comments you want to make sure you got in? Can I be heard? Oh, hi, Mel. Yes, ma'am. Hi there. Um, I'm sorry I'm coming in late. I did hear the first half of the show, though. I just, my phone died, and so I couldn't even say anything. But um, I had a couple of comments. Uh, first off, can I actually be heard well or no? Oh, you're crystal. You you are crystal clear. Go right ahead. Wow, it works from the final episode. That's horrible. Or the final session. Okay, so um, I guess I'll go in reverse. Uh, 
I always feel weird when I'm reading the word cracker in any book as an insult, since I don't think it insults white people when it comes from black people. Because I think in like the historical aspect, the cracker's the guy with the whip, right? So redneck seems like an actual insult since white supremacists tend to not like working in fields. Um, I feel like when black people say cracker, it's cute to white people, but when other white people say it, it's highly troubling because they're unmasking themselves or something. Um, as for, I actually agree with Demery Ford on the point he made about the flags outside of some of the court buildings in some parts of the South. Um, it begs the question of whether or not Nazi flags are raised high around Germany because it's part of their quote unquote history. Um, and to reference his question actually, I'm surprised that there were only two men in this book. I think that was Zaid and Sundiata. Like I understand that her father and her mother broke up and that she's basically been in a woman's prison in and out for most of the book. Um, and that her grandfather exists, although he seems to be in the background most of the time. Oh, sorry. Oops, I, I, didn't myself. I didn't hear anything. We, I didn't hear anything. We were, we were listening. Oh, sorry. Um, right. There just, there don't seem to be a lot of men besides, well, a lot of male figures who are really highlighted besides Zayd and Sundiata, which is for good reason. I mean, they both had a great impact on her life, but I wouldn't say, I, actually, I would say that the book still, even though there weren't any other men, I would still say the book kind of leans in a feminist direction. I think, I guess the follow-up question would be what is feminism or the definition of feminism, but it seems like overall men don't seem to be bashed in her book. And she still manages to find a whole lot of people, well, well, like positive female figures throughout the text. And she praises them and then it's over with. Like, I don't recall her whining a lot about women's images in America. And when she did, it was how like black women are all viewed as prostitutes by white men. And she blames the system when black men expect their black wives to stay home like it's a 1950s TV show, stating that like black, holes, black households can't really afford that sort of thing. She also blames the slave master when she's almost gang raped. I think whenever you have a capitalist problem, a gender problem, a math problem, anything, just white culpability usually isn't too far from it. Um, let's see. Oh, when she says that she wonders how people who are very gung ho about bombing people in other countries and warfare would feel if they knew about, well, if they knew that they were supporting babies being burned to death, my automatic thought was, I wonder how people would feel if they knew that the clothes that they bought from Walmart and Sears funded the building which collapsed on the factory workers in Indonesia, or how the avocado industry to some extent funds cartels in Mexico. Like, I, I think that sort of thing even though those were committed by white people, just sort of echoes how Mr. Fuller says that we're all supporting the system of white supremacy all the time, intentional or not. Um, let's see. I noticed any time the court, well, like how the courtroom starts getting whiter and whiter, the less that there is that racism can be talked about in the courtroom, which seems strategic overall. Like generally any time the room starts getting whiter and whiter in this book, it's like the possible justice meter starts getting lower and lower in the hospital room, in the courtroom, at the rally with Zade for the bail money where they were calling her hair kinky. Um, let's see. I'm almost done. Uh, later, she talks about non-segregated, well, in this part, actually, in the postscript, she talks about um, non-segregated neighborhoods where white and non-white children, I'm assuming, are playing together. And I started shaking my head a little because I was reminded of the I have a dream speech um, where Martin Luther King places emphasis on the little black boys and and uh, girls will be holding hands with the little white boys and girls. And this doesn't strike me as a sign of a society without racism. It could actually strike me as the opposite. Um, let's see. I thought it was interesting how she described that on Friday nights, people in Cuba were getting dressed up to go and hang out. And then in the next instance, she says she's surprised that in Cuba, well, it's such a lively and richly cultural place, um, particularly when the US press gives the opposite picture. And I thought, I would, I, I, unfortunately took all the time in the world to see Boardwalk Empire, the HBO, sh the HBO show that was just on. And if anybody saw it, like Boardwalk Empire is basically the 1920s version of Breaking Bad. Um, and the impression I got of Cuba was different. I actually assumed that it was a party place that happened to be socialist, a place where like, I guess the US business interests in the 1920s, 30s, 40s were going to just like spend all their money and have a good time or whatever. Um, Let's see. Oh, uh, I had an overall thought. Um, I didn't actually know anything about Asada Shakur before this book, except that she had fled to Cuba. I actually thought that she had pulled a Mark Essex and then fled to Cuba. Like she just, she rage killed, I guess, and just went to Cuba because she just couldn't take it anymore. Um, 
but I actually found myself identifying with her, with her a lot in the book. Um, a lot, actually, from going south in the summers, the neighborhood she grew up in that was right next to the rich neighborhood, um, trying to identify the racism suffered by every other non-white group in the country. I haven't been nearly as constructive as she had, but um, yeah. And that said, I, I did know about COINTELPRO before reading this book and, of course, Guantanamo Bay. So I wasn't super surprised by how she was treated. Um, and I was actually kind of surprised she wasn't treated worse. But overall, I think she's a really, really, really intelligent person. Just the way she handled a lot of the stuff from the get just seemed really, really smart. Um, I think that was all I had. Can I be heard? Uh, yes, sir. We can hear you. All right. Thank you. Good evening, guys. Good evening to all the, um, all the callers. Um, I, I found it interesting in the book when she brought up the... Um, the issue of race and how it's viewed in Cuba because my family, I'm of Trinidadian descent, and what I found um, just through my life experience, I know quite a few people from quite a few different islands and some from Central and South America. I find that in a lot of the Spanish speaking uh, Caribbean and Central American countries, they tend to have a very confusing view of race and it tends to be more nationalistic, and then they get into the hierarchy of your color. Um, and when I saw uh, Henry Louis Gates had a whole series called Black in Latin America, and he visited four different uh, areas of Latin America, and, and just to hear what the people were saying, and it's something that I experienced in my life. A lot of them, um, and a lot of people that I know, including one of my uh, closest friends, uh, told me that they didn't, one especially, specifically a guy from the Dominican Republic in, in the uh, documentary, said he didn't know he was black until he got to the front. And, you know, somebody told him basically he was a Spanish-speaking nigga. And for the first time, like she said, he came into contact with the understanding of what being black meant, which was something he didn't experience as acutely in the Dominican Republic. And I know in, in Trinidad and a lot of Jamaicans that I know, there's no confusion on their blackness. I think because Britain uh, controls those islands, they tend to take a, a look at blackness very similar to how Americans do even though we may not overtly experience it because Trinidad was not really run by anybody white. Um, so um, our view of race, I think, is a lot more like the American view as far as the understanding of what being a person of African descent is, whereas in a lot of like, Latin-speaking Caribbean countries, um, they tend to look at things more like a nationalistic, so they'll say they're Dominican, and then from there they'll break down the hierarchy of whatever their color structure is, which I found to be very confusing. And um, I had, a, like I said, my best friend, he's actually Dominican. Um, he had a baby with a Puerto Rican woman, but he always, throughout my relationship with him, until actually we got into an argument and I had to give him a history lesson, he used to say he hated Puerto Rican. And um, he would say this in front of his son, and I said, you're going to psychologically damage your child simply because his mother's Puerto Rican. So you're talking about how much you hate them, but you're with his Puerto Rican mother. And then I had to give him a history lesson on Puerto Rico and the Dominican and even Trinidad to let him understand just how African he really was, as well as the African, uh, his presence in uh, Puerto Rico. And after we had that big uh, blow up, and once I started to talk with him, he started to shift his behavior, and he stopped talking about Puerto Ricans in that way. And um, it's just interesting because I've seen that quite a bit. So I just wanted to chime in with that. Thank you. Right, right. Good to hear from you. Call it 5234 and uh, our narrator, Mel. Brilliant job reading the text. Uh, thanks. She has pitched in for the last month and a half to read for us. Excellent observations as well. Uh, any of the other folks with us uh, have comments they wanted to make sure they got in? Call her at 9400 or uh, anybody else who didn't get a chance to share uh, during the second audio portion or after the second audio clip? Hello, can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I like, um, especially last week's um, reading, and um, I like when she was talking, when she, um, I, I agree that um, there wasn't a lot of information about men and men in her life or her father or, the, you know, baby's daddy, you know, and, and how he related to the, the daughter. And, um, um, I really didn't like last week when they were talking about, um, you know, you know, sometimes people kind of 
you know, they have a little power and they get real bosses. And I've experienced that in organizations where they try to, um, you know, they, you know, um, and she had also made a comment last week that um, when when she made um, suggestions and sometimes her suggestions are, you know, are, um, considered and sometimes they weren't. But I've noticed in organizations where the men, I mean, we, we talk about we don't understand racism, white supremacy, and I agree, we don't do it. You know, we don't understand, but we have an inkling about it. And the reason why I say that is because when I was an organization, how the men would subjugate, try to get black women to fight, um, you know, keep us separate, you know, um, try to get us in a room. It would be a room with all women and be the only men, and they're talking, the only men are, are they're in the room are talking to us. And, 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 and talking to us about health issues, and I'm thinking, brother, did you go in a room the last time I talked to you? It's like, how do you know this stuff? If you found out from your wife, it's in your wife up here and talk. Yeah. And it's just, you know, just, just try to just, you know, just try to um, take, you know, just railroad us and take us over. And, it, and, it call, and, and that itself comes in fighting. Now, I know about Contelto, I read the books, all of that. But we, you know, um, you know, we, you know, just as she was saying last week, we have to look at ourselves and we have to make adjustments. And I see that a, a lot. I don't see, like, for instance, I don't see um, black men in that book. I didn't really see it, and I would love to have heard about her dad and what her dad thought, you know, and, um, you know, where her, her dad visited her, did the dad visit the girl. Um, I, for, I, I forget if the, the man, I thought he was, I don't know if he was in prison or he died or anything like that, but what? You know what happened with that guy? I I didn't. I maybe I missed it. Maybe I just it just flew over my head. And and that's pretty much it. I just think that um, you know that um, of course white people do things to us, but we do a lot of stuff to ourselves. And you know, and, and we can say, well, I we know that the cause of it is white racism and white supremacy, but there are certain things that we can't. I mean, our our um, parents after um, World War, um, Civil War, doing a lot better job with regards to keeping families and stuff together. It appears to me than we, we're doing, and we just kind of have to get better. And she goes, "Our little family. It was four women: her mother, her aunt, her daughter, and her. No men. You know, and and we 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 got to get, you know, have to have. When we talk about family structure, we have to talk about that's a survival unit." We need to talk about family because she couldn't get couldn't get the daughter. Nobody could get there without the help of a man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they have to be present, and we need to include them. And we need to make you know forget about nuclear structure family. That's their terminology. But we talked about families for millions, and we need to go back to that. In my opinion, I mean, I'm, I don't think I'm wrong. We talk about sometimes we could be wrong. I don't think I'm wrong about that. Uh, and the way that we do that is. Um, we, we got to get to the point where, you know, I have trust issues with men and respect issues. And, and um, you know, and, you know, and I, I'm only looking at this through the perspective of a woman because that's the only way that I can look at it. You know, and I know that women kind of dog each other out, but I see men manipulating women just like white people manipulate us. And that's it. And thank you for letting me talk. Have a good day. I'll meet myself. Mm -hmm. uh, we have about 13 minutes uh, before we will be all done with the text. Uh, if folks have other comments, they want to make sure that they share. Uh, theme. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, this is Noble. Uh, just piggybacking on what the last caller said about uh, Sasha Shakur, uh, not mentioning too much about her uh, relationships and stuff with opposite sex and all of that. And I just think that in the system of white supremacy, it just comes back to eroding and uh, sabotaging relationships. I think that's just the main aspect. And I, I, I just looked on Wikipedia and the Sasha Shakur was born July 16th, so that would make her a cancer. So 
from what I know about cancers, pe- people who are born as cancers, they are very uh, relationship-oriented people. So, yeah, that is kind of like a surprise that she didn't mention too much about it in, in her in her uh, book. But uh, my, my, my observation of it, it would be that, you know, the system of white supremacy is not, quote-unquote, romantic and... It's not love is not a part of the equation, or it's not a part of the revolution for non-white people because white, uh, this is white supremacy is designed to sabotage it and, and and not make it a pleasant experience. And and that's the whole point of relationships is to have pleasant experience. But I I closing in my comments closing. I just want to say I enjoyed the book and just I put that in one of my my favorite books that I've read. So those are my comments. Just to get in really quick, because we do make an effort to analyze, think about the problem of white people, racism globally. Um, there have been, uh, or at least I have seen uh, what seems like an increasing number of reports about racism in Cuba uh, this is like 2014 through 2015. Some of the things that she said about um, the ease with, with which uh, white people and black people that you could see their children playing and it's no big deal and that sort of thing. A lot of those kind of Pollyanna uh, perspectives on racism and Cuba, they're very common, uh, but they have been, uh, in my view, increasingly challenged uh, and revealed to be false. Um, where they have talked about you have a lot of the same problems where black people can't get judged. Just all of the same stuff that people complain about here. Uh, is going, I mean, even mainstream outlets, NPR, they did like a big five, six minute piece uh, on this within the last 12 months. Uh, just about a lot of the exact same things. Black people are the first ones uh, fired, last one hired. Exact same things uh, that people talk about here. Uh, and how blackness is disparaged overall. And, and even some of the things that you heard in the book where she was saying that people would, unless you were uh, deeply melanated, people would say that they were mulattoes or all these other kooky terms uh, that they come with, which re- reminded me of Brazil. But that anything that I can possibly do to get away from blackness, you know, I'm, I, you know, my my great, 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 great grandmother uh, was, you know, a quarter or something. So, you know, I, I can't just be a black person. Uh, just all of the hallmarks, the colorism that I think caller in Florida mentioned um, are, are present there. And it is a global system. It, to me, would just come back to, again, if you don't understand racism, white supremacy, what it is, how it works, everything else that you do understand will only confuse you. Uh, and just the difficulty of, of grasping the all encompassing nature that even when you move and it operates a little differently, but this is still the same structure uh, that just not being able to grasp that. Um, I don't know if I had mentioned, oh, I see we got no one more person. I just want to make sure I got it as well. I suspect some of the folks that are listening to this program, if you speak with your, if, if you yourself were not around, if you speak with some of your parents, particularly people in the New York, New Jersey area, uh, there were black neighborhoods that notoriously had signs up that said Asada's welcome here. You can see some of the pictures of these images online. Uh, Yasin Bey, formerly known as Most Deaf, he talks about seeing these images in his neighborhood uh, when he grew up. So I suspect depending on your age range, but if you have some older black people in your family, if you're in those areas, just ask, you know, if people remember anything about Asada, that sort of thing, to see if, if anyone recalls those signs. Uh, the caller at uh, 5640, you should be with us as well, 5640. Yeah, thank you. I was just going to piggyback on what you said about the uh, people not, you know, claiming their blackness. I was just thinking of the recent incident in uh, Dominican Republic. Did you? I don't know if you touched on that, and I apologize if you have, and how there's a leak. I think yesterday there was a mass deportation of uh, most or all the Haitians that were there, and even those that had been there since uh, you know, their relatives or ancestors had been there since the early 20s. And uh, the Dominican Republic was trying to say that, you know, they were targeting um, people that actually had dark skin and to physically remove them from the country. Was that brought up? 
Uh, it wasn't just because this is focused on the uh, book club. Uh, so oh, yeah. that wasn't brought up today, but we have talked about that uh, before because that, that deportation process uh, has been talked about and going on for some months now. So it has come up on the program before. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, and uh, just to get in really quick in as well, that anecdote about this white guy that I guess went and fought in Angola to to fight for the liberation of black people, but then came back to Cuba and got upset because his daughter was going to marry a black person. And I guess that'd be a cowbell too. He didn't want, he wanted uh, infamously sounded right out of the lips of, of Dr. Welsing. Um, he didn't want his daughter or his child, his grandchildren. He didn't want them to be dark, um, which just for me, again, highlights, uh, and I think she said that, you know, white people, uh, if they are allegedly not racist, they would not only have to fight against, uh, I think what she calls systemic racism or structural racism, which would just be other white people. Uh, they would also have to fight their own uh, internal racism. And I just haven't seen any evidence that white people are going to do that. Uh, in fact, that anecdote that she shared uh, for me, is just another example that you can have a white person, you can have a white woman, you can have a white man, and they can hashtag and talk about how they're really upset about South Carolina and they marched for Trayvon Martin and they think what happened to Renisha McBride is just ridiculous and they're not going to put up with it and they can go out and raise funds for the rape victims, the black female rape victims of Daniel Holtzclaw. You can do all of those things and still practice racism. It's easy to do those sort of things. And uh, just again, for us to not be easily duped into thinking that just because we see a white person who does something nice for a black person, this white person, she's not calling us nigger. She's not trying to come in and shoot and kill and stomp and choke us. This white person is saying she has great information, actually helping us to solve some of our problems that even that white person, you should suspect, you should think, is still a racist. Uh, I just it just further clarifies that uh, that point for me, and and just how uh, how difficult it is to just grasp the the totality, the depth uh, again of white pathology. Uh, other folks uh, have comments. I I, I would even uh, I'll, I'll just say quickly. I can see why so many white. I think this book is very popular. Uh, many white people reference this book. I think that's why you've seen some of the references to the book during uh, what they call the Black Lives Matter protests and what have you. I can see why this would be a popular book with whites uh, to some respect because it does leave that slight little window that there could be possible room for rehabilitation of white racists. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. If other folks have comments, feel free. I agree. May I be heard? Yes, ma'am. I, I agree with what you have said that white people can do the the entire politically correct um, black thing and still be racist. I totally, positively, 100% agree. And I have, um, you know, been around white people since I was a kid and was one of those kids who was bust and, you know, and I totally, 100% agree with it. It is so ingrained in them. Just like our children pick up white dolls at three, can you imagine what attitude they have about us if our children are picking, you know, you know what I mean? And it's, and it's just, it's part of the culture and one of the most hateful things I've ever heard was this one guy from Cuba his mother was instructing him. He was black. She was black. Do not bring home no black people, black woman. And because um, she, she, you know, had, you know, kissy hair, and she did not want grandchildren. Look, she did not want her grandchildren to look like her. And they've been grained that. I mean, okay, I, I, we've accepted that. What what happened, and we have to fight against it because we have to be codified, and we you know, and we have we have choices to make. And um, I I've just seen it. I've 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 yet to see a white person who who have not you know once I get to know him, talk to him, you know, do the Doctor Jekyll Mister Hyde thing, and you can see that they're total racist. I've not met a person yet 
like that. Anyway, that's it. I'll meet myself. Thank you. I want right. to thank Mel for reading. That was really excellent in case I don't say it again. Thank you, and I'm very sorry I cannot speak Spanish properly. It sounded fine to me. On the last uh, point that was discussed, uh, I've said it on the program before. I've, I've worked 27 and a half years in close proximity with white people who would, at the, at the risk of their own life, would, would uh, save the life of a non-white black person and come right back to that fire station and practice racism and white supremacy. They can't help it. They have to. They just have to do it. It's just, you know, saying that it's going to change, they're going to get better, they're going to get educated. Oh, no, they have to. They have to practice racism and white supremacy. Uh, we are pretty much done. Any... Uh last sentence and thing folks need to get in before we uh, close the book on this text and move forward on a new one. Yes. Can I say one last thing? Uh, one of the reasons I think that she may not have mentioned black males too much uh, because when she talked about Seth and Haruba, I believe, those guys that were members of the BLA, you know, if it's true what I read, you know, they were some, they were pretty uh, hardcore guys. I mean, uh, guys of action. Uh, they were saying that they would, uh, once they realized that the police was busting these drug dealers and then uh, allowing the drugs back on the street and then making a profit from it, then they came up with the idea that they could, you know, do the same thing as far as uh, the drug dealers out of business and then uh, dump the drugs into the gutters, you know, to keep it from the hands of the, the community. And then it turned out to be the drugs that the police owned. And then, uh, so they were wanted men by the corrupt police. Uh, and if she had revealed anything, you know, about their activities, it could have incriminated them. And they were in exile, I believe, at the time. And, uh, you know, I can see why you wouldn't, you know, mention a lot of things that could uh, incriminate the people uh, at a later date. Probably mm. All right. uh, Give our thanks again to Mel for uh, doing a splendid job with the reading. Uh, great narration. Uh, I think really added a Great dimension uh, to the text. Anything uh, you want to leave us with before we depart? Um, thank you to everybody for listening. Thank you for letting me do this. Um, it was an awesome experience. And uh, I am, I did have one question. Are we voting on the next book? <laughs> uh, we are voting on the next book. Um, um, I have, uh, I do have black robes, white justice here. <laughs> That's right. Maybe we should put that in too. But um, I will collate all of the suggestions because some people, some of the people that are listening right now uh, verbalized their uh, submissions for the next book. And some people wrote them in. So I'm having to uh, try to nab all of those in one spot. And then I will 
post them on Facebook uh, and just announce them and then folks can vote and we'll have the, uh, the tally within a couple days or so. Um, I guess to if folks, any of the folks that are here who named a book title, if you want to repeat it really quick, that would be grand. Anyone here name a book title that they think we should do next? Um, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Um, I thought maybe Black Man's Justice, White Man's Grief by Donald Goins. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Uh, I would, I would suggest uh, who's pulling your strings. Uh, destruction of, uh, I believe it's called Destruction of Black Civilization, Chancellor Williams' book. May I be heard? Yeah. Black Labor, White Wealth, Paul Anderson. Right. So we have a few other votes as well. Uh, I would probably say the host would probably put in a down vote on destruction of black civilization because we already have one uh, book study session on that text. Uh, not that it wouldn't be worth multiple, but that does already exist in the cow's archive. Um, black labor. Women love. Okay. I have all of those. Like I said, some people wrote and emailed uh, suggestions as well. So we'll put all that in one spot and then people can submit their vote and uh, we'll announce by hopefully Monday. So people will have time. They can go get the book and uh, we'll be ready to roll. Uh, do you have a suggestion, Mel, or are you just curious about what we were going to read next? I'm horrible. This is the first book I've read in like weeks. Oh my God. I have no suggestions. I'd probably say something by a white person, but um, whatever part of everybody votes for and whatever you find the most constructive um, from one book to the next. Right on, right on. Reading is more important than watching television. Always a big fan of, of getting constructive uh, text to read. Okay, so we have those five, and then I will add the, the few that people wrote in already as well, and I'll just make that a post on Facebook. Uh, maybe I'll tweet it as well, and then you can vote. I'll, I should have them all together, so I'll say it. I'll verbalize it on the compensatory call in tomorrow, and people can vote, and I'll give the final tabulation. should be done by Monday. Cool. Hey, hey, Gus. Yes, sir. What What was your analysis of uh, the book Picking Cotton? I just finished that, and um, you know, it was. I don't know if it'd be good uh, as a book study, but it was uh, it was quite eye opening. Uh, my analysis. Um, it was incredible. Uh, I would go back to the forgiveness piece. I thought that stood out pretty strong for me throughout the pick for people who don't know picking cotton was a book. Uh, it's written with two white women and a black male. Uh, I think Ronald cotton, if memory serves is his name is a black male in North Carolina. Uh, he was, uh, convicted of raping, uh, I believe more than one, two different white women. And ended up serving 11 years in prison before he was exonerated, exonerated uh, with DNA evidence. And so the white woman who falsely uh, accused him and Ronald Cotton, the black male, they write this book together and they take turns from chapter to chapter talking about this whole uh, experience. Um, and uh, the, just the theme of forgiveness where Ronald Cotton... Uh, he's doing all this time and all these horrible things are happening to him and he's having family members die. Same thing. Family members die. He can't be around him. Just, you know, totally ruin uh, this whole black family. And uh, he's talking about forgiving this white woman and eventually not being angry with her and moving forward. And I don't have any animosity or hostility. And meanwhile, the white woman is just talking about how she can't stand him and she hates his guts. <laughs> his whole family. This is when she thinks that this this guy raped her. It turns out she is wrong. Um, and then even once they give the information, you know, where he has been released and he didn't do it, she still fearful and thinking, oh my God, he's going to come kill me and take out vengeance and nothing is, you know, further from the truth. He's just, you know, I just want to get on with my life and <laughs> make sure I can see my family and stay away from uh, anything that even closely resembles a cell. It's just, it is, it is an amazing uh, text on so many levels. It's painful to read uh, for a lot of reasons, but uh, yeah, I don't know about uh, a book study session just because it's one of those where it's, it's, 
it's so much to loathe. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, you can learn some things about the system of white supremacy, but it's it's kind of one of those like, oh, and then they switch chapters. So one whole chapter would be just the white woman. And then the next whole chapter would be Ronald Cotton, the black male, talking about his experience. I don't know how people would feel about uh, having to sit through, uh, I guess, like 250, 300 pages of that. But it is for those who can stomach it. It is a revealing, uh, a revealing text. Uh, Anywho, uh, thanks for everyone sharing. Uh, Appreciate the feedback, the book suggestions. Uh, We should be here tomorrow, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific for the compensatory call-in. Uh, we certainly will devote time to the situation down in South Carolina to get observations. Workplace racism, I'm sure that has popped up on people's jobs uh, where they, you know, people are talking about it or maybe you are being asked about it and having to deal with how you uh, discuss or process all this. If you are on the job with white folks, we'll deal with that tomorrow as well. In addition to other uh, incidents, there were other incidents, other uh examples of racism that happened over the last seven days. Uh, it looks like we also might be here Sunday morning. Uh, that was the time that was picked for our once a month early broadcast, uh, which is interesting timing to be on, uh, on the Sabbath, uh, on this week after all of this occurred. And I think that also is the first official day of summer, uh, this Sunday, but it looks like we might be here, uh, Sunday, I guess it would be 12 noon, 9 AM, uh, Pacific, um, doing our early broadcast to give listeners who are outside the States an opportunity to participate and just people who can't chime in during our normal broadcast time. But it looks like we should be here Sunday early in the day as well. Uh, We'll update all that tomorrow. If folks have questions, gripes, complaints, feel free to drop an email until justice at gmail.com until justice at gmail.com. We're also on Twitter at until justice at until justice justice. Uh, Thanks again to everybody who has uh, contributed. I hope it has been constructive and you got something uh, really appreciated uh, reading Asada Shakur again. It's been some years since I've read the text, but it just has a lot of great, uh, great food for thought. Uh, I think it will definitely uh, benefit your understanding of racism, white supremacy, and a great illustration of black self-respect. Keep an eye on how things progress with her down in Cuba. Uh, over the next few uh, weeks and months. Remain codified. I know it's warm. I know it's the weekend. Folks will be going out to uh, enjoy all of the splendid summer weather. Uh, Do not lapse in your codification. Uh, If you uh, are going to consume any intoxicants, alcohol, be codified. Uh, Definitely do not do so if you're going to be around other white people. Definitely make sure you avoid being around whites who are consuming alcohol and even be mindful about the non-white people that you're going to be around if they're consuming uh, intoxicants. Just a lot of times we end up with very avoidable problems uh, as a result of alcohol consumption and being intoxicated Uh, just would be one of those things where I would encourage sobriety. If you can't do sobriety, uh, at least Try to make up some rules so that you uh, will not have unnecessary difficulties not being behind the wheel. I would even say you don't even want to be a pedestrian if you're going to be under the influence. Get to one spot, stay there, and then you can depart the next day after you're lucid and sober. You just you don't want to make it easy uh, for race soldiers uh, to hem you up and cause you a lot of unnecessary trouble and waste a lot of your time and money uh, behind something really, really silly, really, really avoidable. Uh, With that, again, under conditions of war, sobriety would be best. Uh, We ask, creator, help us remain patient with other black people. Help us remain patient with ourselves. Remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times, in all places, each and every time we are in contact with another black person. It has been time. Replace white supremacy with justice as soon as possible. Context of white supremacy. Signing out. Thanks again, Mel. Nigga, you so brainwashed. I'm a victim, brother. You're a victim. I'm a victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Even my conditioning has been conditioned. <laughs>